they really equally distributed? Are they, do they concentrate in certain areas? Um, you know, uh, you said they're city owned, is that right? That's right. Yep. County owned or city? Uh, city answer? owned. City owned, okay. So, um, uh, I, Ian, I don't think you made a, a very clear uh, uh, description of this. So uh, to John's point and to everybody's point, uh, so um, CD4 is, it was interested uh, and actually a lot of the council districts were, were interested uh, once they discovered that there was a lot of these um, unusual and eccentric uh, properties and parcels uh, that actually belong to them and they're not private, uh, but dimensionally were awkward for proper uh, use and proper um, development. And so uh, there was a, um, a query at what other alternative uses can be that might actually be more like community focused. So the low hanging fruit was a community garden or like a little urban farm. Um, and then that kind of spawned uh, this whole exercise in terms of, okay, let's really look at uh, what part, what orphan parcels you have and uh, look at opportunities or, or, or not. And that's what spawned basically this exploration. And I think Ian, like if you zoom in, you should probably uh, show the jury members uh, your, uh, your radar the, the six or seven categories that each uh, parcel was defined by. Um, I think if we flip to the video, yep, yep, yep. Oops, you can see. Yep. Here on the, the left-hand yep. side. So these are the um, small sites and you, you can see um, on the left-hand side, you can see the score based on these parameters. So- It's really small to yep. see, guys. Oh, um, uh, I'll go back to the slides. A image in which that might be easier to see. Um, no. It might be difficult because all the slides. Go to the sixth uh, slide. The so, yeah, I don't oh. want to. I don't want to disturb the flow of uh, the conversation. It's, it's not. Um, be quiet. I mean, I, I think in in terms of e in terms of the description you gave and the the problem formation. And, and then I think kind of in response to kind of what some of what John's saying, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, we're almost now looking probably for uh, a set of metrics that uh, you defined a problem, you've given us a formal solution, but now I'm kind of wondering, okay, well, if it's, if it's about the urban farming, uh, then um, how much are you actually producing? And how much of the problem are you therefore tackling? So I, I think that's the kind of end metrics of what this can actually do. You know, how many people can it house? How much food can it produce? Um, I think those are some things that I would begin to expect out of uh, this studio in particular. The, there, you know, the, if you define a problem. Uh, it's not just showing us the, the thing that solves the problem, but it tells us how you've done it and how much of the problem is solved. So do you guys have that information? Uh, we don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that's, I'm thinking about this exercise, because in one way, I really admire what you've done, which is, you know, I know of at least two or three occasions in the city of Los Angeles where people have been hired to try to map all of the vacant sites and figure out something to do. And the enormity of the issue always ultimately overwhelmed the person who was trying to do it. One of which was Dan Rosenfeld, who Tom will know and some of the rest of you. He, he never was able to wrap his arms around it. And even though this is a student project, I admire the way that you've wrapped your arms around it and managed to somehow be manipulating the whole thing all at once. So in that regard, it is kind of an urban problem, though it, it gets there. The one thing, though, the more and more I think about it that I feel like is missing here, which ultimately would be an outcome, would be somehow within your algorithm to not have all the sites be even, but to prioritize. Like, which ones do you do first? Mm. And how do you make those decisions? Because that's also an equity question. And whenever you do an exercise like this, in the end, they're always looking to you to kind of like give them some rationale to how to order, prioritize, tell them which are the most functional, which are the least. So I, I think that on one level, the part that's successful here is your ability to visualize and wrap your, around, or wrap your arms around 
in a very logical and ultimately ever more systemic way as you get better and better at bringing in more and more factors um, of the problem itself, but then you still get, I think the word was used a moment ago, outcomes like, yeah, the outcomes are really important. And one of the outcomes is how do you prioritize what you do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? So that would be another layer of scripting in essence. I would also like to know a little bit more about the notion of flexibility in your approach, because I was always under the impression from earlier sessions with you that there is something that adapts to the amount of demand over time. I mean, we're talking over years also. And um, is that still part of your project? Is that still something that can be worked into your algorithm? Uh yeah, th theoretically, yes. The uh, thing that we uh, were also kind of discussing is that um, one of the interesting things that we start to think about in this project is that um, when, when there's, say, like a problem in, you know, one part of the neighborhood, that the nearest site might not be the site that's most um, appropriate for receiving, say, a certain program or certain maps, um, that if we begin to, again, chart this as, a, as matrices of sites, that we can, um, say, shift um, content from one site to the other, um, so that the flexibility isn't necessarily like intra-site, but maybe inter-site, if that makes sense. Well, you know, I think that is a very important point in your project and um, probably responding most to what uh, John was also asking about the, the urban aspect of this, yeah, that, that there is really a way in your project that reads the urban issues of the city, um, these little sides or these, these strange sides in a way are very Los Angeles type um, issue, I guess, re resulting from the single house structure that we have here. But, um, you know, exactly this, this uh, me mechanism or how approach or whatever it is uh, to, to decide which side is good for what use. Uh, I think that is something that should be absolutely at the, at the beginning of your project and it's important in the presentation. Yeah, I will point out that the site that on, on this slide is called Extra Large, like that's Harold Henry Park, which already is a very well-used community park. I happen to live three doors down mm -hmm. from it. So there's something about the filtering system that you've used here in your algorithms that isn't really discriminating already between spaces that actually are highly public and are successful versus ones that are vacant or underutilized. So it's a little bit, I don't see that really for this exercise as being a fatal flaw. I, I think it's more to do with just how you become ever more sophisticated at doing this and how many millions of lines of script are you gonna to have to write to get to where you need to go? I mean, someone will do it. Maybe artificial intelligence will do it, who knows. Yeah, it was one of the interesting things we found when we were querying for um, vacant sites was that uh, different organizations will classify if something is vacant differently. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but um, like certain things like, um, like nature reserves can still be classified as vacant um, can, and can even still have like land value attached even though it's theoretically for like ecological purposes. And uh, uh, the, part of the reason why we left it in our, in our matrix is that we wanted to test to see if the script can respond to a large site. Sure. Okay. Um, there's no more comments on this. Uh, just to let everybody know, this is actually uh, an ongoing conversation with Council District 4. Uh, there is a pilot project up in Toluca Lake, uh, which began with a very modest uh, community garden. Um, it's not much to speak of and from a design point of view, but was uh, significant in terms of uh, discussing it as a prototype to uh, enable uh, and leveraging these uh, abandoned or, or underused sites. Uh, so um, it's it's kind of extraordinary how many of these empty sites there are, 
And if you really look at that um, taxonomy of all the matrix of all the empty lands, it is rather significant. And of course, each one has a different uh, socioeconomic uh, catchment or impact radius. Uh, sometimes it, it's a very high social um, economic uh, demographics and others is actually very needy. Um, and so um, CD4 has a spectrum of different demographics that they're hoping to exploit with this um, exercise. So, can, I, can I say the um, I, I've been quiet because I want to hear everybody else and you guys know me and I actually will talk to you again before you're you're done. But I, there's several things here that I think are very quite um, need to be said. Um, it, the, you've the, the system is um, quite linear. <coughs> what you're missing and this is a, this is the beginning of something I'm gonna completely understand the spirit of, of the notion of where you're going. And it's going to take a while. It, it can't happen in a year. This would be a, a much more serious research effort. But there's um, in this process, there's a series of conceptual leaps that is absolutely essential. That it's not lineal in in the in the literal sense, and that there's 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 times that you're asking questions that these various um, the cataloging these this various research leaves, which expands the questions. And um, it doesn't follow such a kind of neat and tidy kind of order, or it doesn't establish um, what in the 60s had been a Christopher Alexander. It operated under a very reductionist kind of set of principles. And today we see the world in a bit more complex terms, and it requires these leaps, conceptual leaps. And then when it gets to the, the, um, the scripting and the translation, we need to talk. <laughs> because it's it's it, it's absolutely not lineal and as your projects were developed in the eugene project it was a provocation and really quite experimental still we're asking questions whether certain um abstract much more subjective organizational ideas can find alignments with the huge performances that were demanded urbanistically. But then there was this enormous conceptual leap and a series of actually very um, kind of specific judgments that allowed these projects to, to advance or not to advance that you know, of course you're shaking your heads and you, you've been through this, right? Because I think as you got to the end one, it would be fair to ask some serious questions as you looked at the physical environment that you're now kind of missing a series of very, whether it's north, south, uh, it was brought up, whether it's topo topography, whether it's orientation, it goes way beyond that, having to do with the specificity of the site. Because as you're moving into the site now, John mentions he lives three blocks from, from the Windsor Boulevard thing. Well, now you're gonna ask a completely different set of questions. You're starting to move in the scaler, right? And again, it's gonna kind of take another set of judgments or you might have identified these sites within various terms that you haven't done yet. That it's fairly kind of simple at this point. That is you looked at the, ver the nature of how you um, define these various neighborhoods vis-a-vis -vis your, your meta narrative of the program you're bringing in, um, a horizontal vertical garden, your social, cultural, right? Um, ecological program. But it's gonna, it just takes much more expanded kind of work in this direction. But, but the, the, the general spirit of the thing is actually very, very interesting. I assume a lot of people, John, I'm looking at you on my screen, we would be on the same page here, right? Especially at the very end as it leaps into a kind of a formal kind of response. I don't know, Kaliski or Enright? <laughs> oh, 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 either i got both of you on my screen now as soon as you talk you pop up john yeah um sure as i said you know i mean we didn't talk about it a lot but i think the the formal gestures uh are interesting and are you know it's, it's a lot of work to get that far uh but i think the project's most successful uh, and innovative in the at the urban level, and the idea of mining information and data, uh, which is already done. Well, one could say that's always been done. It was markets that did that, or, or you know, hundreds of developers scouring cities looking for property. I mean, there's a kind of the city as an organism 
of interested parties constantly changing, buying, changing hands, and an economy occurs. Um, the fact that now we can start to mimic that, or or those individuals are actually using those tools for uh, economic gain many times, to to be able to leverage those for design or for um, other uh, better uh, social uh, uh, and equity results. I mean, cities can do this and should be doing more of this probably. And I, I, so I think the, the idea and the topic is right, right where, you know, most things are going. And unless we as architects can manage that and uh, be part of that discussion, it'll just be used like it usually is for, you know, economic gain uh, for those, those who have the expertise or will pay for the expertise for that information. So you, uh, I'm, I'm always going to be for, you know, architects and designers looking for ways to leverage that information. Uh, we know it happens anyway, uh, just out, out in the world for, for other reasons. So um, I think it's a smart proposal, uh, as I said in the beginning, and I think many people would agree, it's the, just the beginning of an idea. And it, it, once you can figure out how to bridge that from, from information to form, I think it would be super powerful. But I, I think that um, there's a lot more information you need to mine, I would say. That, yeah, that, that. Put that last image again, where you showed the, the, um, the five, the five buildings. Yeah. Um, John, what happens, in, in, especially I'm looking at L, um, these guys moved really quickly and they are now capable in nanoseconds of developing very kind of coherent things that for me become a kind of a, a problem because they made a leap to this and you're smiling, <laughs> Ian, um, and both you are because they know there's a certain level kind of a bullshit in this thing that they can move here formally very, very quickly. And the, 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 but there's missing this whole front kind of um, analysis, the urban part, and this piece is a huge kind of space between those two. You guys know that. But this is all about this is all about potential, and 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 sort of like how do you become critical and smart within the potential of what this system is offering? And I think John Enright is right that what this really is, from my perspective, since we do this all the time in our practice, but with different tools, is a question of are architects going to be involved in this, or are they going to seed this? to other folks. I mean, right this minute, the reality is, is that all these programs exist right now. Esri will sell them to you. And you can basically do this right now, right this second. You know, we are, we have our very first contract with a city in Southern California where they literally want us to do this. So the question goes right back to, I think the question that Eric and, and Stefano asked at the very beginning of this is, is starts to be, well, what does an architect bring to this question that a planner doesn't? And, the, and in some ways it's knowledge of systems of materials, typologies, all the things that are the implications of these drawings that those folks know nothing about and, and they don't wanna know anything about it and that's okay, but they're gonna take it over if um, somehow architects don't figure out how to um, figure out the material, the physical, yeah. the spatial dimensions and scales of exactly what you guys are doing. So I like what you're doing. It, I want you to do it even more. That's the focus in the studio, John, to move exactly. in the quantitative to the qualitative. Exactly. But but you guys, and they, they know this, um, then these have to communicate back directly to your your the focus that you started with having to do with the horizontal, the vertical, the, the living, et cetera. And they should be very clear that way. Because right? Right. Right. they're now communicating from some very straightforward idea, right? That becomes not very literal, but it becomes a general kind of notion of the physicality of this thing, of where it's taking us, right? In terms of the nature of the, um, and again, at a, at a qualitative level, right? Mm -hmm. It's always been this discussion that uh, Tom, that uh, you've always had uh, when we began uh, sustainability back in uh, in the office, of how to how to shift um, ethical responsibility from uh, like a Catholic guilt to more into like objects of desire, right? Just to move the social conversation forward. 
Um, and this probably kind of like feeds into how do you create certain kind of potentials of desire, uh, even if you begin with just a, a pr practicalities of, uh, of social ethical um, uh, kind of parameters. But I think, I think everybody's provocations are spot on. And I agree with the assessment of your work. I think what, what everyone is looking for is a solution to what I will call, or a response to what I will call pejoratively, the Skynet problem, which is how much are you willing to rely on a completely self-generating system without your hand of authorship or your active critique of it and the fact that it's selected a park that somebody on the call lives three doors away from is absolutely emblematic of the Skynet problem for me. This is uh, version 1.0. I know, I understand. That's, it's a very strong 1.0. Like everything, there's always room for improvement. All right, well, I think on that note, then, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian, Calvin. Uh, job well done in terms of at least uh, starting a larger provocative discussion. I think it's time now to move on to uh, the piggyback yard. And there are three teams on the South Pacific. And we will begin with uh, Anoush and Shinar. Then we will go into Larissa and we will end with Zhao on that scheme. Um, Anoush and uh, Shinar, as you load up basically uh, your scheme, I just want to remind all the jurors as uh, most of us who are in LA uh, are very aware of this particular site, uh, this site was uh, try uh, the city tried to buy the site for the uh, for the uh, LA Olympics. Uh, there's been constantly uh, attempts to try to purchase this, but uh, South Pacific will not and could not sell it because they had to uh, make an, equi an equivalent infrastructure to replace it that will still allow the entire distribution network of the city of, from LA port to the rest of the continental United States. So that impossibility of finding a substitute, even if they wanted to sell this land, uh, became a deal breaker. And as we all know, uh, Michael Mawson uh, made versions of that. And so um, this premise is on the possibility of using an air right. Uh, and the narrative is what if a, a Southern Pacific is allowed to operate just like the Hudson Yards was allowed to operate, um, and what are the potentialities of creating um, a community above it? Uh, CapEx issues and, uh, and, and OpEx issues in terms of is, was, was, was tabled, at least for the, um, for the students. Okay, so Anush and Shinar. Actually, before we begin, just a quick uh, mention that we're live on YouTube, just so we're all aware of that. We're live on YouTube. Yes, we are. Okay. Hello, I am Anoush. Hi, all. I'm Shanar. Uh, let me share my screen. You guys can see our screen. Yeah, put it on uh, presentation mode, please. Sure. So, um, our project called the Iceberg. It's it's an off-grid uh, living urban prototype. There are multiple existing proposals with premises to address the current and future urban issues of Los Angeles. It could be argued that the city not only needs proposals and policies, but also experimental prototy prototypes for its uncertain future. Providing socioeconomic and ecological notion of equity should be prioritized to model a new urban prototype. The prototype could be mass produced in varied locations, uses, and scales to provide optimized access to urban qualities. The iceberg is an attempt to design the first urban scale off-grid urban prototype in Los Angeles with a regenerative system within a walkable neighborhood on the east side of LA River. So Piggy Bag Yard site owned by the Southern Pacific Company sits on the east side of LA River and connected with Long Beach and with Alameda Corridor. It is an isolated land within the triangle of three interstate freeways surrounded by the Lincoln Heights and Boyle Heights neighborhood from the east and Chinatown and downtown from the west side. The rail covered site is disconnected with the city by infrastructures, though our district is within the quarter of a mile. Union Station is within a quarter of a mile as well. Approximately 150 acre land can almost fit four Hudson yards and seven piggyback yards. 
uh, it has almost half a mile edge alongside the river and two existing entrances. The site is digged approximately 10 meters from the Sorton Street, uh, where is the I-5 um, freeway. The heavy manufacturing site is within a disconnecting proximity of residential, cultural, and civic zoning. 25% of the site is covered by uh, rail tracks and remaining is almost uh, covered by reserved container. We started to looking at the possibilities of land occupation on rail, off rail scenarios. We uh, tested um, to minimum to maximum uh, inter intensification and we ended with uh, iteration of initial schemes by interacting to co uh, components of combinatory system uh, embedded with site condition. Our argument for the site is a living uh, off the grid in LA. We need to change our way of life. Economy, ecology, and equity are three dynamics of sustainable communities. Our thesis is to optimize the cycle in an off-grid urban prototype that loops around a cycle of resources, processes, products, and users. In the scenario of iceberg for the piggy backyard site, the resources, LA river, rainwater, gray water, waste, solar energy, and wind power uh, are in the process uh, with natural river cleaning, water management plants, solar panels, biogas to fuel processes, photovoltaic facades, micro wind turbines, hydroponics, and aeroponics. And the products will be fresh and uh, fruits and vegetable and potable water and electricity. And this cycle will go on and made a regenerative system. The regenerative system uh, started with the waste from the uh, residents residential and mixed use programs and uh, produce biogas energy uh, and the biogas energy will produce uh, fuel cell energy and uh, then the water from the river will be naturally cleaned and the water from the rainwater and gray water will be cleaned with a purifying system to uh, cover the uh, demand of the community. And the energy, all types of different energy, solar, wind, uh, and fuel cell will be connected to a smart grid in order to distribute and optimize, uh, optimi optimization of the distribution. Uh, the idea is to copy the prototype in different spots uh, alongside the LA River. We have uh, defined five uh, other uh, lands that are al alongside the LA River. And the idea is that uh, the DNA of the prototype could stay the same. You collect the water, clean it, and use it. It could be um, used as a complete prototype, like a piggy backyard project, the ice pick that we're doing, that the scale uh, allows us to have everything together as an off-grid system. In other sites, it could be only uh, agricultural, or it could be social housing, or other types of programs. So um, the iceberg, our scheme, is the first urban off-grid prototype in LA. It is combination of three systems, eco-filter, eco-farm, and eco-village. The system built itself up in a short-term and long-term phases. The short phases starts with site preparation, uh, reshaping the river edge, routing partial railroads, partial uh, excavations, and providing initial infrastructure. So ecofilter and water waste management infrastructure is the next phase. As the site is limited by the ex existence of the Southern Pacific Rail Track, construction of the platform as the foundation of the project and providing the circulation infrastructure comes next. Low and mid-rise constructions followed by the eco farm on the top of it is the mid-term vision of the project. The long-term vision is to build the eco-village and build a new community in this off-grid prototype and runs in through the regenerative system. Uh, as the site as a, is a representation of a micro proximity neighborhood, uh, the vehicle circulation are limited and this run and bike uh, parks are um, uh, prioritized. And 40% of the site um, 
uh, will be uh, built area and 42% urban farms and 18% landscapes. So these are the programs that we will quickly go through eco filter, transportation hub and parking, the mixed use, the office and hotel, the residential high rise and mid, mid rise and the uh, landscape, aeroponic towers, hydroponic farms, greenhouses and hyd hydroponic farms. And this is the all together. So the demand uh, of the water uh, in the site, uh, we are putting uh, 30,000 population there. Uh, we try to maximize, uh, test the maximum number of the people we can design an off-grid system for them. First, we started with the 50,000 and then, then we go down to 30,000. So the demand for 30,000 people is a 3.6 million gallons water daily, and it will be covered within the system. Uh, the rainwater will be collected all over the site, the gray water as well, and the water purification system will uh, put, the, put it in the system to uh, recycle and reuse. Uh, about the food demand, so 51,000 uh, 51, pounds of fresh uh, fruit and vegetable is the demand of the 30,000 people daily, and it will be covered with the uh, hydroponics uh, farms and aeroponic towers. Uh, the amount of uh, 10, uh, aer uh, where they call aeroponic is the same as the urban um, hydroponic farms that, are, that we are putting horizontally. And it will be distributed within the site as it's a self-sufficient site. Um, and the waste will be collected uh, and will be recycled. Uh, and the biogas that is uh, uh, produced by the, uh, by the recycling of the waste will be used by the uh, fuel cell uh, power generator to, um, to use as a as source of energy. This is the process of collecting uh, waste and uh, to go to the biogas collector. And the energy will be, we will be collecting the solar energy and uh, wind power and fuel cell energy to uh, cover the demand. And all will be connected to a smart grid in order to distribute uh, in an optimized way. So this uh, start to echo, uh, with echo filter. Uh, echo filter is collecting, cleaning and distributing clean river water uh, with micro dams, which are mani manipulating the river flow. Uh, it consists of five stages of natural cleaning system, providing recreation lake and park of the site and also surrounded communities. Eco farm, the second part of our uh, site, hydroponic farms, greenhouses, aeroponic towers, producing sufficient fresh vegetables and fruits for 30,000 population demand. And eco village, uh, which is the most densified uh, zone inside. Uh, so regarding the environmental um, data analysis, we uh, trying to understand uh, how can we uh, reshape uh, and um, uh, reshape the uh, towers to have a solar um, uh, wind energy? To maximize the potential yeah. that we can grasp the solar power by uh, where to put the solar panels, where to put the uh, wind uh, turbines in order to reshape the formal. Yeah. This was a study that for individual towers we did in order to optimize the forms. So, and these are the outcomes, yeah. the multiple outcomes of the large, medium, and small size towers. So these are uh, our sections, uh, three sections uh, from uh, uh, east and west and north and south. This is from the LA yeah. River, uh, go to the I-5 freeway. Uh, and here you can see the uh, construction of the existing railroads and the um, platform. 
Mm -hmm. So the idea that uh, we mentioned that as a studio, we decided uh, the first one and he was explaining was that we will keep the uh, Southern Pacific Yard Railroad and um, everything that is happening is above it. So in a section, it's obvious that everything is going on, going on top of it. And these are some zooming sections. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just uh, announce uh, that we're now joined by uh, Deborah Weintraub, uh, Chief uh, Deputy City Engineer and City Architect. Deborah, uh, welcome back. Uh, for most of you, uh, Deborah has been uh, one of our key advisors from our early LA Now days. So it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have uh, Deborah uh, join, join us again. Thank you. And also Thanks. we have uh, Roger Sherman uh, coming back. Roger, we're just joking, uh, joking about you that you're taking over the universe. Uh, so you, know, <laughs> you had time for us. I don't uh, know. You're, the you. world's your oyster. <laughs> Uh, so Deborah and Roger, just quickly, uh, we were looking at basically the, 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 the piggyback yard as a, as a potential opportunity to use the air rights the way that the Hudson Yards was, also from a constructability point of view, but without getting to the complexity of financing and capex that has haunted uh, the real Hudson Yards. So uh, with that, I, I would just uh, leave it here. Thank you. Okay, so I'll wait in <laughs> since I've worked on Piggy Backyard. Also, um, first of all, I wouldn't expect any less from SciArc um, students, but the drawings are phenomenal. So congratulations to both of you. Um, you know, we looked a little bit at Hudson Yards for a rail cap project further north and just to weigh in a little bit to money because the infrastructure investment here would be huge. Um, the only way that it could pencil out financially is if the cost of the rail cap construction wasn't any more than it would be to buy that open piece of land that you see off to the right there. So um, with the other project we looked at further upstream, it just didn't pencil out. It just was too costly to build the platform on which to do all this development. So I just thought I'd mention that as a way to start. Uh, thank you. Well, maybe oh, after COVID-19, like international trade will collapse and they won't need that yard anymore and the land price will come down. That's what we're all hoping for there, Ben. <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, um, John, the real thing with piggyback that uh, when we worked on the River Master Plan many years ago, our colleagues, our consultants from Denver said that the rail companies in Denver kept saying to them, we're not going, we're not going. And one day they just picked up and left. Yeah. And, and so it's very possible here that they'll decide that it's not efficient for them to have this rail yard for some reason. And so this kind of speculation about what could happen there is really important. Well, I, I agree completely. I mean, I think what we know now might not be true in 50 years or 30 years. And so yeah. that's why the speculation is worthwhile. And I agree, I'm, I'm sort of so overwhelmed by the amount of information and the integrity of the project as a whole in terms of how it was presented that I'm, I'm thinking a lot rather than just <laughs> responding because I think you've done a really fantastic job of, of presenting a story and um, I may have some thoughts in a bit. Well, well, while John is thinking, I'll just pile on and say, it's nice to see this again a couple months later since the midterm. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm now sitting in a dark room, I realized. Um, it looks like your project has taken on a much braver and more um, aggressive engagement with density than it had before. 
if you want to say say a few words about that it didn't feel this packed in and metropolitan and congested as as it did previously and i'm not saying that as a criticism of it i mean i think it as all the other people have noted it supports your story it augurs for a legitimate economically viable future and it probably generates uh helps you generate a more robust population on the site but it really changes the character of the solution dramatically uh, the, we wanted to um, test the maximum amount of uh, population people uh, maximum amount of uh, population who we can provide uh, in this system who can live in this system but uh, this is not the, uh, for that we uh, increasing the population um, amount. So, yeah. and, I, and as it's, a, uh, we're calling it a, a prototype, uh, we are trying to push the limits to understand how far we can go to design a, an off-grid living uh, neighborhood within the city of LA or any other metropolitan uh, mega cities. So this was a test for us to exercise how you can do it in this amount of land with this amount of uh, energy that you can produce or collect the resources and everything. And uh, this is how dense we could uh, go by far. <laughs> so is it maxed out? Yeah, if yeah. we go a little bit more, we tried, we started mm -hmm. with 50,000. Uh, it was not off grid. So okay. we come down. It seems like it could have been useful in your in somehow concluding your data that would have helped answer Eric's question and might have eliminated uh, Deborah's would have been that um, you would have it have been led to some macro conclusion that this would be more of a la defense mm -hmm. or a second city or e I don't know if he shows you we had a project in, in Madrid which is very realistic in the north of Madrid that must have been again the second um, commercial hub, et cetera, but you would have made a macro conversation that isn't limited to the cost of, of the platform, which is an incredibly, um, in terms of how we approach projects, you could say it's just about an insignificant argument in terms of what we're interested in. And again, if we were in other cultures, if we were in China right now, it wouldn't even be a conversation. This, mm -hmm. this is only connected to the kind of limited nature of how we develop cities under the private sector. And you could claim that that has maybe a shelf life, that that isn't going to be the single way we talk about things. But it seems as though with your information and how you approach this project, you could make an argument having to do with energy, mobility, et cetera, et cetera, that this, this would be an absolute proposal. In fact, this drawing, it, it, this is kind of the second, the second intense. Mm -hmm. It's the like, second coming of downtown. <clears throat> right, yeah, yeah. and it puts people within a um, a five minute radius of culture, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, the nature of the, the 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 facilities within this part of the city and the ones that you're developing, and you might have also pushed that a bit. Mm -hmm. There are kind of an essence of this culturally, or are there are other kind of notions of this, although maybe your ecological one is strong enough. The the, the fact that it's self sustaining, mm -hmm. with, with the agricultural idea. It seems like you would have pushed that a little more at this scale right here, that it is very aggressive idea, right? And, and you, you, you want to make the claim right here. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, how many cities, of course, were started near bodies of water, right? Of course, for, for obvious reasons. And, um, you know, uh, and I, I'm less, uh, I guess, concerned about the trains and all that, but I do understand, um, uh, I, I don't think the project necessarily is about that. You know, it could just stand alone without the, the train infrastructure below and still do all the things. You said a uh, filter, uh, uh, farm and village, right? Yeah. And I liked the village word and, and the scale of those, those tall buildings are really wonderfully odd like you see it here, it's like a miniature downtown. Like they're thinner, they're like the same proportion and then they're shrunken in a little way, uh, which, I, which I find really interesting. I, I think formally the project's uh, uh, really well done, but, but I could imagine it, you know, and, and on a policy standpoint, like, okay, kind of like the last project would find these kind of 
uh, uh, now, because it's interesting, the river then gets co-opted and it becomes a negative place, right? Like everyone kind of thinks of the river now as industrial and, and you know, the, the, it's been co-opted, right? So to incentivize you say a policy like, look, uh, uh, you, we'll give you this land and you can develop it if you clean the water, right? And you clean the water in this kind of way. Right, so you give these kind of tools that I could imagine, you know, a series of these things marching down, right, all the way down to wherever Long Beach or San Pedro. So uh, I think there's some really nice things about the project along that. I think the presentation um, you goes so fast through so much sustainable uh, percentages and data that I wished at some point you could, and, and then given the formal dexterity that you show with the thing itself that there'd be a couple of moments where you could show me exactly where that technology affected the form of the building and made it let's say kind of click so to use the words of the stu studio in a combinatorial way how did the curve of the river and the use of water uh, uh, meet the mechanism of the pump and the tubes and the, all the things you need to create and and, and I, I think it can i don't think you've shown that yet it's as if the, the formal are shapes only right now uh but they could be devices and that's not that's kind of unfair that they're shapes only i realize they're roads and they're towers and they're and they're things um but but that to me would be like next level on this kind of project like how you would uh, try to create a new aesthetic given the, the the rules of this kind of game, which is very good at synthesizing, right? So the the thing you've learned is how to synthesize form data mm. and um, let's say even program uh, to create a kind of newer language of what architecture can be. So it isn't mm. just problem solving, because but there is so, there are problems to be solved in what you're doing. Uh, but there's also kind of beauty and oddness and miniature towers and green towers. And, and, and those things I think are okay to celebrate and to address uh, at, at the same time as having your cake and eating it too with all the, mm. the good sustainable things that uh, we would all want to be incorporated in, in any kind of future. But, but we always know that uh, that could also be legislated. So we could just make uh, buildings, uh, you know, carbon neutral by making it the law. Now, uh, once that's done, there's still architecture to be done. So it isn't, right? So it's not just um, uh, regulation. It's how you do it, how you create a new kind of model. So well done. Just to add to that, the point we started was that we're thinking about how cities not only needs policies and now there's data embedded in uh, urban design. So it was about how we can uh, rethink about the new codes, not new policies. So it's on, I think we both of us think that it's an ongoing project and mm -hmm. because it's a large scale, it could be developed much more. Yeah, thank you for your recommendation. John, I thought you were going to go someplace else. And that uh, I don't, the, I, I saw this mid review, but it was what, seven, seven weeks ago? Aren't the tracks in this direction or something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to go there and that the flow of the, which is going to end up having to do with gravity and loads of, of building over this thing anyway, I thought that would actually take you someplace in terms of the language. Mm. That would have kind of pushed you in the different exactly I thought where John was going with the combinatory, that mm. even the history of that, if it was if it was eliminated, would start forming or have something to do with the language of the project and give it a particularly linear linearity and directionality in this case. We should always be left as the history of the project, regardless of the tracks were removed or whatever. Yeah, you know, in terms of the combinatory, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even be talking because I, all I saw was the last image of your project, but I feel compelled to, um, to build on what Tom was saying, which is if it's really about combinatory, a combinatory approach to urbanism, I wonder whether or not it's really about looking at, at I guess what I would call kind of a succession of 
of form of the city where the where the line work and the geometry of what used to be the rail lines to Tom's point are actually then occupied by the treatment of the water. Since your new preoccupation is not with with rail transit, but it's with water treatment and whether or not in effect you could create something like uh, cleaning grounds for the water, um, not by just simply working with the with the riverfront that you adopted, mm -hmm. um, but rather with the fact that you're actually drawing it into the site through these siphons or uh, capillary action, which used to be the rail lines. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So you're actually creating more surface area and more riverfront mm -hmm. with what used to be the rail lines. And it becomes a kind of adopted master plan that was really something that you didn't create, but you simply adopted. You, you, you found there, which to me is super interesting because it talks about the history of the city mm. and about circulation, the transformation of circulation from transportation to water. Exactly, yeah. So, so get... the problem with that, Roger, is that this has been a rail yard for what, how many years? You're going to talk about contamination? Oh my gosh, oh. I'm going to talk about contamination. Yeah. Because you would actually, if you wanted to do that, have to excavate the entire site, 25 to 30 feet deep, and, and haul that soil up or cap that soil. In some ways, just a simple cap would be your simplest thing. You just bury it all. Because <laughs> we're well, facing, uh, you know, so the idea that you're going to capillary action river water through there and the, the, the earth is going to do any good to it, I think is um, um, naive. Well, I'm actually I'm actually thinking about projects like Governor's Island, where they use phytoremediation and processes which are natural um, to actually clean the water over time, which really talks not to an immediate master plan, but one which really is thought of over a long period of time, because a site like this would not happen instantaneously; it would happen over decades. And so, so maybe phyto there's phytoremediation will only remove certain contaminants and. The kind of contaminants we find in rail yards, it won't it won't address. Mm -hmm. So, um, but getting back to Tom's point about any city but but the United States, the the government would take a a more proactive hand here and say we need to house thirty thousand people and this is um, a good site to do it on. Um, we need to make an agreement with the railroads to repurpose this for city growth and city development. Um, I think is it's a really interesting conversation to have because we actually suggested this site to the whole Olympic Committee. We said embrace this um, because you could do a lot. You have a lot of money to spend, and they looked at the contamination and the need to um, negotiate with the rail companies and said, thank you very much and walked away. So I don't know how we, you know, maybe it's at the federal level or at the state level, maybe it's at the state level now, since we can't talk to the federal level anymore, that um, there's, there's, a, there's some kind of policy about repurposing urban yards like this into uh, better uses for housing, jobs, um, as you said, uh, wastewater cleaning, all the systems that, that cities need. And it's an envir a, a kind of comprehensive environmental argument like your project makes um, about localizing all these systems in one neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I don't know, Tom, you have the chutzpah to do this, but I just haven't seen a lot of, and chutzpah is a Yiddish word, excuse my use of chutzpah. It's funny, but I, I, but, um, Deborah, I would have said that the, the studio, it's, um, its focus is much more about establishing a desire, um, potential opportunity um, that's in some future place. But with that, proving the realism of that desire through uh, a very different way of looking at the city through a macro lens. And so they look at this within broad terms and not within the limited notion of territory, whether it be this site or whether it be smaller sites, and to reestablish the terms of which we evaluate the development right. of our urban environments, which this country is very limited through its, its, in fact, it's just about non-existent in terms of any kind of broader thinking of the consequences of our acts 
within the metropolitan terms. And to me, it'd be as simple as um, driving my, uh, my, uh, my uh, Tesla, which is insignificant in the um, 17 and a half million people in our metropolitan area. And I'm only a single person of that, but the macro notion of that and, and Mr. Musk's notion that if half of us did that, it would eliminate 50% of the, of the air pollution, right? right? But thinking in those kind of broader terms, and I have to say, again, I've watched these people over the year, and it was a, a kind of interesting, especially in the beginning. Um, you, you, um, they've, you've come a long ways. Because I look at this, and I have to say, I'm, um, I'm amazed with you guys, that you really got your arms around an incredibly complicated project. And um, in your, they're in their 20s, um, I would say you've got to oh, you be 30. <laughs> oh, whatever. You're, you look you're young. young. You're 35. You're getting uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. <laughs> Roger, you were introduced as uh, heading up a firm now that, uh, that gets uh, $1.5 billion worth of work. Um, I think we're producing characters that can get their arms around the kind of scale of the projects that are going to be the compelling projects of this century. You know, a couple of thoughts as we look at this. First of all, I think everybody's right in sort of the frustration of how we do these things in the United States, maybe. But I will point out that on the outlying portions of Southern California, we are building cities with 30,000 people mm -hmm. in them. We do figure out how to plan across 30 years for infrastructure improvements and things like that. And so it's not like the problem doesn't exist in the United States, it's more that it's sort of like for various economic reasons pushed to the periphery of our cities. And so it could turn itself in perhaps someday in the future. But I'm really grounded in pragmatics too and I've been thinking about this. And one of the things everyone keeps talking about this is density. The reason you're only at 200 people per acre. Mm -hmm. 200 people per acre actually is dense, but it's not particularly dense, it could be much denser. The only reason it's not denser here is because you've given yourself, I think, an admirable um, constraint, which is the ecological constraint. You're trying to make something that is um, self-sustaining. And, and I guess my big comment sort of as a critical framework comment for the project, because I, I love what you've done, is more maybe questioning the premise that the idea of a independent island surrounded by the rest of an urban area, as opposed to an interdependent sy system. I kind of wonder about that a little bit. And because as I'm thinking about it, it's like, you know, this is also, there's a conversation about equity in here. And I'm a great believer in these vertical farms and urban agriculture, but I really wonder at what point vertical mixed use starts to break down in terms of its benefit to the city as a whole like what, it, it's like a question and it's not a critique at all, but it's a question. Like if you were to put 60,000 people on this site from a city standpoint, would you be able to support public benefits that would um, accrue to a much larger percentage of the population as a whole? And, and so I kind of, I mean, to me, this is a provocation of saying, how far do you really go with vertical and horizontal mixed use all imploded into one site that then starts to be limiting itself to whatever it itself can support and that it doesn't have any obligation to the things that are around it. And, and so I, I kind of want to play with the formulas a little bit and maybe move some of the urban agriculture someplace else, increase the number of people that are living on the site, have more of a conversation about what are the amenities on this site that interact with the stuff that's around it? But it's still fantastic. I mean, totally amazing what you've done. But I, I do think that there are some philosophical <clears throat> could I about how growth occurs. To could I, uh, John, you, you, you just touched a little bit a hair on something that I'd like to raise, which um, doesn't, isn't really about your, your design proposal itself. But, um, and it's something that uh, I would never expect that you you all you both would be thinking about it this kind of young, relatively young point in your careers, but I want to kind of just tell you about a little bit. I'm not going to call it quite a trick, 
but it's something that OMA uses a lot. And I know that uh, E and uh, Tom do as well, which is to people um, who are in government and as well as developers. You heard Deborah talk about the enormous cost of, um, of cleaning up this yard. I, I can tell you that what Gensler would do and OMA will do and Tom and E when we're working on super, something super huge is you, you develop a stalking horse which is to say, okay, let's imagine 30,000 people in Riverside, no contaminated land. Okay. Is it really cheaper to build 30,000 people in Riverside? And then you begin to go through the cost of those 30,000 people commuting every single day and the cost to the environment and the cost. We're doing this with the homeless right now. What is the cost? You think it's free for somebody to be out on the street? No, it isn't. It's $6,000 a person every year for, you know, and you begin to realize that the cost of doing it elsewhere is not necessary, is not cheaper. It's actually more expensive. Mm -hmm. That's why I call it a little bit of a trick because if you're really smart about it and you work with people like HRNA with urban economists and others, they will, they will help you provide a platform mm -hmm. for making an argument where the thing is crazy, but crazy like a fox. Yep. Then it actually is the smartest thing you can do. And it's not so ridiculous. It's actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, but you have to think beyond just being an architect. You actually have to think about the data. You have to think like a climatologist, like a transportation specialist and so on. I see Tom nodding a lot. So well, I you know he's going to say something. I think about yeah. it. Ecology is all about it. Mexico City, they're evaluating. They, they've evacuated some of the distant distant communities from the city. And they're doing exactly that. They're, they're studying the, the relationship of these, these very, very uh, remote communities in Mexico City to downtown and it's you made the the the, uh, the whole conversation for this for this relationship that you gave them the the meta narrative that's let's go to the next <laughs> yeah, just I, having I fun say, finally I want to say one more thing because I think with COVID the idea that you could live in Riverside and work in downtown LA and never have to commute um, may now exist but the idea that we would have to provide power water, sewage, waste, uh, waste streams for 30,000 people, and we could put all those systems right here, right where they live, that might be a stalking horse argument, rather than, you know, in expanding our wastewater mm. treatment systems. It's, it's about building the infrastructure as part of the, of the city neighborhood, um, I think might be an, adding the infrastructure needed to support this many people. Might be an interesting, interesting and that maybe that, that infrastructure can support the other neighborhoods nearby. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I've seen that argued both ways. It's fascinating because in Santa Monica, with their, um, they've had this whole thing about water, and it's been fascinating to me about the arguments in Santa Monica between is it cheaper to distribute the water, the uh, water production, or to con or clean up or, or to concentrate it in one place? And I, I don't know that anyone. Has quite figured that out yet because I've seen it argued both directions. Yeah, but Santa Monica is this big. Yeah, that's true. It's only a mile. Of LA is. <laughs> um, I, think, I, uh, I wonder, um, just one thing, um, um, I, I wonder which aspect of your project you think could be exported to other parts of the city or other cities. I mean, is there something out of um, the research you've done? We, metabolic cycles that you've described, the logistics of how this thing could come about, is this something that can be applied to other areas of the city and be transformative like that? Do you think that that is uh, feasible or is this very, very site specific? Uh, so uh, the, one of the main ideas was that this prototype could be copied alongside the LA River as a macro urban idea. And we, uh, let me share again, uh, we found a couple of other, uh, other lands that could uh, be, um, pot have potential to uh, copy this. Can you guys see my screen? I will just show one slide to answer this. Yeah. 
So this is the amount of the water quality uh, properties alongside the LA River. The ones that are white now uh, is the parts that are uh, naturally clean. For example, uh, Glendale is naturally is is a natural system that is cleaning the water. So if you copy this uh, by time by phasing alongside the river, it's a macro idea that you can help the river revitalize by time. And the, may I, may um, I ask you there? Sorry, but <laughs> I. I I uh, know you showed this, uh, but it's along the river and there are plenty of empty sites along the river and so on. And like the previous project, this the four, it also plays out on empty lots, you know, the or so-called empty lots, even if it's a park, it's deemed to be an empty lot. Um, I'm wondering if there's any of this that can be applied to the existing structures rather than consume the last remaining resources of available land. Um, th that to me is, uh, is the question. You know, can one intervene in contexts that are already built up in an incredibly inefficient uh, manner uh, and improve them? Or do we just keep going further and filling up every empty space that we find until there is no more room to move anywhere? That is really the question. And <laughs> implicit in that question is also, what are the urban qualities that you uh, bring to the site? And if those are things that are replicable in other places as well. So the idea of regenerative system and the off-grade urban prototype could be anywhere, not only alongside the LA River, this is our project alongside the LA River. And we were thinking about the macro idea that could develop that. But this idea that the, the loop could be closed and you can provide the demands and supply could be uh, worked anywhere in any mega cities. But it depends on the size of the and the scale of the site, I think. Uh, how far you can go with the density and the resources globally, like resources. What are the resources? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Stefano, the answer to that is probably to actually uh, capitalize on the on the hard infrastructure that the Army Corps of Engineers actually built in and uh, actually kind of exploit the negative of the uh, the concrete embankment as a positive uh, platform to infuse maybe potential uh, filtering devices uh, in lieu of uh, converting the whole thing to a riparian and natural um, ecosystem. Okay, I think um, in, in light of our schedule, we should we have to move on. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Shinara and Anoush. Uh, really, really a uh, beautiful job. Um, thank you. And to, uh, Larissa. And after Larissa, we're gonna go to Xiao. So there's still two more projects on the same site. All right, Larissa, it's yours. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, oh boy. Uh, sorry, I don't have my monitor. Crap. I just. Um, can you guys see this box? Yeah. Okay, well, I will just go. All right. Um, okay, so uh, a few months ago in March, we were presented with an alternate reality in Los Angeles. Um, with the city shut down, hardly any cars on the road, Los Angeles had the cleanest air in recorded history. Um, and this is a glimpse of a potential future with clean air and clean skies for a city of 4 million people. Uh, not too long after this, it's been documented uh, as returning to having the worst air in the nation in terms of ozone pollution. Uh, and 
And the Piggy Backyard is the last large plot of land to be developed in Los Angeles. And due to its size and proximity to downtown, there is an opportunity to make an impactful change for the city, providing ecological technology research and educated education that would be accessible to many as we try to move uh, toward innovating for 2050. Um, and there is a second benefit for having uh, some kind of technological, ecological research that could be utilized on the site because the site is located in the most um, environmentally uh, polluted place in Los Angeles. And in terms of census tracts, it's also, um, it relates to uh, people's incomes and uh, race and ethnicity as well. So there's all kinds of disadvantages in this uh, site. Um, and a lot of this can be attributed to the car traffic and congestion in the area. The site's located in the center of some of the busiest freeways in Los Angeles. And these freeways also uh, divide the surrounding areas, making it difficult. Um, another thing that adds to this is the the site's located along the major distribution network of the Alameda corridor. Um, so because it's an important site, uh, we will be keeping it, but it further uh, serves to uh, disconnect the city. Um, but uh, the, the site is centrally located, so it has the possibility of being a, a walkable urban community. Uh, so there is also potential for housing on the site. Um, it's located only like a 10, 15 minute walk from uh, Union Station. Um, so the current uh, case study that we all have for the site is um, Hudson Yards. Um, and in, in terms of the financial feasibility of it all, um, and a lot of what we hear is that uh, it being compared to uh, a city for the rich, a playground for the rich, um, and this person is describing the uh, going up to the um, the edge as being like on line for a Disney theme park ride. Um, so how can we make, so it's important to note that Los Angeles net zero plan is still not getting them to net zero by 2050. So 8.5 of these emissions would be from air, sea travel, and industrial use, and new technologies would be needed to, uh, as, such as carbon negative forests um, and other technologies to reduce offset carbon uh, emissions. So um, um, but the idea is how uh, can we make it something that would encourage people to uh, become more informed and interested in, uh, in the future of these uh, technologies. And so uh, this quote's from Ray Bradbury, uh, quote in uh, Architecture for Ecologies, it's no use building it unless we dramatize it enough to make people use it. I'm all for making Walt Disney our next mayor, the only man in the city who can get a working rapid transit system built without any more surveys and turn it into a real attraction so that people will want to ride it. And uh, in terms of finance, it might not be as, uh, you know, as much of an economic engine as luxury housing towers, but uh, technological research um, could be something that could drive uh, money uh, into the site um, as well as culture. Um, so uh, this is the initial program asking uh, I had for midterm, this is a, uh, net uh, zero in terms of uh, electricity. So it ran off of uh, only so solar panels. Um, and I looked into uh, the 2050 plan for uh, Los Angeles and uh, found based on uh, doing, combining a community uh, alongside uh, carbon reduction would uh, amount to uh, 3,000 residents, which um, uh, would require a significant amount of uh, solar panels on the site if uh, we were to only be generating power um, on the site. Um, but uh, 
since then a, a, um, increased the, the program. The housing is still the same. So the, the housing would still be um, net zero as well as the retail that goes with it. But um, uh, I've added uh, the visitor center um, uh, in orange here and then hydroponics. Um, the housing would be located along the river. Um, and then uh, there would be, um, uh, above that would be decked on top of the uh, rail yard would be um, a performative landscape, which would include a research program, a solar array. Um, and as the first phase of the project, um, uh, a forest of neem trees, which are um, have the ability to reduce carbon as well as um, uh, control temperature, as well as provide green space to uh, an area of the city that needs it. Um, so the, the hydroponics uh, that currently is placed on the site, uh, uh, oh, there's 40,000, 3,000 square feet um, with processing, uh, that eight, processing and distribution would account for about 25% uh, of that. Um, and looked at Aero Farms as a case study, um, uh, which, yeah. And um, so, um, yeah, so uh, six, 60 acres of neem trees uh, would uh, equate to 45,000 trees and sequester up to six, 56,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, and it doesn't take them too long to mature, only 10 years until they mature. Um, and uh, they are excellent food for aiding carbon sequestration efforts because they're fast growing with thick foliage. Um, however, uh, in terms of Los Angeles as a whole, trees do not have uh, much of an effect, so uh, other technologies uh, would be needed on the site. Um, and then the idea is that um, in the future, after the air is cleaned up, potentially um, the site could be utilized as more for agriculture, um, such as oranges or peach trees or any number of root vegetables. Um, and then, uh, so this is like a carbon engineering uh, case study. Um, it's able to capture 550 metric tons of air per year, but it's the technology is still being developed and the metrics are somewhat vague. So the landscape uh, could be left uh, to potentially house one of these or something similar in the future. Um, so in terms of um, uh, transportation on the site, um, thinking about ways to uh, connect the site, um, not only to existing roads, but across the river and freeway as well, um, and utilizing the, uh, the green, trying to best to connect the green parks within the city. Um, so yeah, so then the, the river would be, uh, be made natural into wetlands. And then the, um, uh, this is the site plan, the, on the left side, uh, you have the housing bars and then the visitor center and hydroponics cultural center um, it's on the bottom left. And then the distribution line and then uh, the landscape above. Um, so this is the, the primary road that would access the site. And these are the connections. Um, right now, the, the railway kind of, there's an empty gap between uh, these two housing communities to the north and south. And um, bridging across uh, on the lower left would allow a connection to downtown and Union Station. Um, and then this would be the distribution line that would run alongside the residential circulation um, going past the hydroponics and through the uh, uh, warehouses that would exist underneath the landscape. Um, this would be the parking access um, and drop off points around the, uh, the visitor center. Um, and pedestrian pathways. Um, and then 
here uh, is a section of the site. I um, was thinking about, uh, so on the left, here, there's the housing bars and parking below. Um, in this instance, I was thinking of uh, Archigram Plugin City um, and how the different in infrastructural elements uh, dig into the ground and different infrastructural uh, fragments are exposed. So the distribution circulation, uh, you would walk underneath it and then through the underneath the hydroponics, which would be flowing, and then uh, into the uh, visitor center, which would have a concert lecture hall, um, and uh, above that, a, a botanical garden, as well as exhibition space. Um, and then moving to the right, there would be access to uh, see the infrastructure of the, um, the rail yard. Um, and then above, would be uh, the solar farm as well as the performative landscape and then research bars around the perimeter. Um, this is the view from the river. Um, and this is um, a, a view from above that. Um, thank you. Uh, Larissa, I, I understand um, the visitor center, I understand the housing. Maybe you could go back to a site plan and just explain what the other areas are used for. Mm. Mm. Um, this, this plan? That would be oh. great. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so um, the, the darker green would be um, more of like an uh, kind of like a public uh, walkway with um, more of like an urban park that people would have access to. Um, and then in the center would be, um, this would be phase one for the uh, trees that would um, be planted to collect uh, the pollution from the air. And then the darker bars here would be um, place for a uh, solar array um, as well as other infrastructures. And then the um, pedestrian paths would um, circulate around that for people to, uh, to walk around. Um, and what is the, at the north end of the site, you have a long bar. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that would be uh, bridging over the, the river to establish uh, connections. Um, that would you be, mean, but do you, you mean, mean the, the one, one on site? site? Yeah, on site. Yeah, oh, on site. Yeah, that right above your cursor. Right above. You have that above. long skinny bar that runs the whole northern edge of the site. Oh yeah, that that would be um, part of the research program. So that's that's a facility. Yeah. And the same research is in the snake on the bottom south end of the site. Right. Well, I'm glad you asked for this site plan to be called up, Deborah, and I'm glad, Larissa, you explain, explained it, because I was reading the solar panels as a cut in the ground that we were looking down into the, into the rail yard, but that's not actually what this is. Those are solar panels at grade? Uh, yes. Um. So then maybe, maybe the with your explanation, which helps a lot, you read this as, as kind of a technological park open space where as a member of the public, I could walk through it and I would experience uh, solar panels, trees, all the technologies and then a research center that are working on trying to address the fact that we're destroying our earth, right? And that that's the primary uses that you've put on the site. Um, and that idea of kind of a park or an open space made to demonstrate technologies, I think is very intriguing, if I understood it correctly. Yes, that, that's what it's intended for. So I think, um, in fact, to speak about a visitor center is a little bit sad 
it's 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 too yeah. correct, right? Um, mm-hmm. I think what you're really hinting at is something much more experiential and and exciting, and uh, something that is 21st century, almost um, entertainment in the sense that it could also be entertaining and super interesting to learn how to do something for the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, during the 20th century, we were probably going through a very brutal century of wars and destruction and so on. And so we needed other types of entertainment parks. But now we have a problem in the 21st century that addresses planetary issues um, that have another type of urgency, not any easier to deal with or something like that. And we thought we should create places that are interesting to people and that could show us how we could contribute to, yeah, cleaning up our environment and, and, and learn how to live with uh, other means and so on. And I think this is where uh, your presentation lags behind because I think there is a lot of potential and uh, it should be presented as such. You know, one could, um... The interesting thing is, is, is as a set of drawings, as a set of forms, it's pretty compelling. And, and I think that uh, what's interesting to me is that one could invest in a fairly easy way of building a narrative that would start to um, make this much stronger and it, without changing any of the forms themselves at all. Um, so for instance, when I look at this and in some ways, you're kind of undermining this premise of the studio that was given to you by presenting this as a big open space, because I don't think that's what the um, necessarily the intention of the studio is. But I think, you know, someone's always going to come forward and whether by conscious desire or unconscious need kind of end up producing something that um, goes off in a somewhat different direction. So when I look at this thing, I'm looking at a Google map of the area right now just to remind myself a little bit more of what's around it. And you do have the health center immediately to the east, which is the largest concentration of health uses in Southern California, where the medical center is there, USC, um, you know, it's the old Metropolitan Hospital or whatever. You've got the... um, you know, the connection to Union Station, which you talked about, you've got the William Mead housing project right across the river there. You've got a very controversial freeway intersection immediately to the south that was seen as destroying those neighborhoods 40 years ago or 60 years ago, whenever it was. And, and I see this as a remediation project, that the idea of this project is it's about remediation. But I also think there are some other strategies that are latent in it, which are interesting, which is the idea that could you develop an edge to the river without necessarily having to abandon the piggy backyards and then build something on top of the piggy backyards, which allowed it to evolve. So it's almost like this is the first phase of something that you don't necessarily have to control in the second, third and fourth phases and could be connected at the same time. So I think there's a lot of potential to the idea just as, as a, you know, if I didn't hear anything about it, but I, I do feel like the narrative that's associated with it is self-limiting right now. And with just a little bit of work, it could, it could, um, it could, it, it could have been the, the exact same set of forms could have been presented in such a way that it would all of a sudden be, whoa, this is an incredibly powerful idea that starts to reimagine what this entire area around here can be. So it's almost like the opposite of the last one that we just saw. Self-contained island. This one is like something that stitches everything back together. And, and I think that's the potential of it. And with a little bit of additional framing, it, it would be much easier to, um, to digest. Well, that's exactly it, John. It's, uh, it's, it's the potential of the inversion of the other, uh, of the other party. Uh, so I think right now, I think we should move on. Larissa, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And I think the comments were spot on in terms of uh, locating the potentiality of your thesis. Uh, we just need to double up the, the work a little bit more. Uh, let's go down to uh, Zhao. Uh, Zhao is now the, the last and the third 
of uh, <coughs> the studio. And then we'll go down to uh, Deborah's uh, Civic Center after the piggyback. <laughs> Uh, can, can you guys see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Zhao. And my thesis, we continued uh, the idea of megaphone as urban uh, landscape so, uh, exploring how to achieve a higher level of food equity of human being by giving uh, the freedom of infrastructure machine. Piggyback Yarn located in LA River beside Ridge Yi, which is the central segment of the LA River. More than 10 million people live within the range of 30 miles, and that is a one hour drive of the LA River. And more than 1 million people live within the range of one mile, and that is like 10 minutes walk of the LA River. Over a quarter of LA County Metro storm are within one mile of the LA River. And this is the mapping of the food desert area within LA County. The people living in this area are not be able to access the vehicle and food market is a half mile away from them. Uh, Piggy Bear Yard has the biggest available site near the conversion point of Alameda Corridor and Elk River, which plays a significant role in leveraging the current transportation infrastructure network to eliminate the most intense food desert areas. So, uh, using Piggyback Yard as the food distribution machine and making El River and Alameda Corridor as the major food distribution artery. And at the same time, El River becomes the major connected tissue to unite the uh, dispersed infrastructure network and provide a massive amount of public space to El County. Um, for the existing connection, the transportational point of the Alameda Corridor and El River create a seamless connection to the side along with the L River within three miles. Moreover, the L River can be leveraged 99% of the time. And in this range, Piggy Bear Yard also is the biggest available site to unite existing uh, infrastructure. The current infrastructure network across the L River provides the potential scenario that's how to leverage the air ride of the L River. For the distribution case study, the Hunts Point Distribution Center located in South Bronx, uh, South Bronx of New York City, uh, in the, is, uh, that is the largest uh, distribution center in the world. It can feed over 60% of the produce for New York City. Compared to uh, Los Angeles, um, uh, New York, um, the Piggy Bear Yard can distribute uh, food further than the Hunts Point uh, distribution center. And the size of Piggy Bear Yard is less than 40% of the size of Hunts Point distribution center. For the farming case study, the dimension of Piggy Bear Yard is 80 times than um, the dimension of area farm, which is the current largest vertical farm in the world. And the advanced hydroponic technique can increase the yield rate at at least 100% and it can 100% adapt the size. For the processing case study, all the start a fully automated warehousing technique can increase over 400% of the storage rate. So according to those factors, why we don't use Piggy Bear Yard to distribute food up and down of LA? To use Piggy Bear Yard as the fully automated food distribution machine, to use Piggy Bear Yard as the food produce a uh, gigantic factory. The program of this, of this distribution machine can be uh, separated into three major parts. Uh, the first part is harvesting. The second part is processing and the third part is distributing. The electrical amenity can provide enough power for these three parts. The distribution machine of this, uh, the second, the distribution system of this machine is what I would call the Skywalker system. The Falcon as the primary distribution vehicle plays the most significant role to distribute the food. First of all, uh, the harvesting part of this machine contains the largest vertical farm in the world. Which size is 60 times standard current largest vertical farm can provide fresh produce for over uh, 270,000 people in one year. 
After harvesting, the robot will bring fresh produce to packaging, maintain its freshness. The packaged uh, fresh produce will be transported to the cooler area waiting for this routing. The fully automated warehousing system, uh, system can work seamlessly uh, 24 hours a day to store and import food and it tremendously decreases the loss of food and operation failure during storage. The Falcon Tower serves the nest of the Falcon. The fully automatic elevated system can bring the Falcon up and down of the distribution machine. The tower itself serves the function of damage repairing, software upgrading, power recharging, new Falcon uh, testing. As the primary part of the distribution, transfer corridor contains the main um, conveyor system of this distribution machine. As the role in distribution uh, booster station and terminal, most of the imported and um, exported food produced will uh, happen in uh, this shipping and receiving dock. As part of the electric amenity, the power plant plays a, a major, uh, major role in powering up this gigantic distribution machine. Through the platform, the machine can operate ab above the ground and leave the regional program PQVR underneath without inter in interference. Through leveraging the air right of the river, the Skywalker system can expand and connect it to a uh, current infrastructure network. This enables the ma machine to deliver the produce faster and largely diminish the loss of energy and food uh, quality during distribution. At the same time, the Skywalker system in intend to um, create a 52 miles long connected tissue. The public armature can be a catalyst to trigger more human activities for the air river. In the Alameda corridor, the Skywalker system can also use air right and, in, uh, and its existing structure. The low battery uh, Falcon can uh, be recharged through the wireless Falcon charger in the middle. To gain more equity in the basic living components of human beings, we need a continuous build form to give authority to the current uh, ill-related, uh, relatively isolated, freestanding object. The place creating uh, counterthesis or megaphone integrating into the site as an exception to the otherwise undifferentiated the, uh, urban uh, cacophony. Uh, those are the zooming part of uh, the, the south part of uh, the section. The equity is mostly uh, defined by the accessibility. By maximizing um, uh, the conflict status of edge connection, the idiosyncrasy is brought by the coexistence of the beautiful architectural elements and augmented landscape uh, express that uh, state of both harmony and tension. And those are the zooming part of the north uh, part of the, my project. And the regional uh, Southern Pacific and Union Pacific Rail operate underneath the distribution machine and are integrated into the distribution network. The machine itself also has permeable landscape allow people to have access to the piggy bear yard. Uh, by creating artificial land above the current bell yard, the Skywalker distribution machine can just both without fully changing the current infrastructure uh, but to leverage it. And uh, this is the uh, section zooming. This distribution machine not only as the new uh, archetype of uh, distribution center, but also as the large urban gesture in LA. By liberating the distribution machine um, can increase accessibility and equity of food for human. And the machine should be and must be the new landmark of Los Angeles. And this is my last stance. Thanks for my professor Tong and my professor Yi and all the juries. Thank you. Uh, Zhao, can you go back to one of your uh, sections? I just want to see what what's 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 in there. I haven't seen that for a while. Yeah, just stop there. Go to the zoom in. Yeah, go to, yeah, stop there. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. 
Got it. Okay, what? What are you seeing? Help us. No, no, I'm, no, I'm just trying to. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to relate uh, the components of this distribution uh, machine uh, relative to uh, how he claimed he was trying to preserve the um, the rail yard at the, at the bottom and trying to see basically how how big of a machine he's actually proposing. I'm trying to understand scale here. So I would like to understand um, phasing here. I would like to understand where, um, so where do you start? Um, how, how can this develop? Because obviously this is not gonna drop down from the sky and onto this site and then there it is. Yeah. Um, so I, I, know, I know you have a plan and uh, there is probably a certain list of, of what's the most important in order to start this. Can you walk us through that? The, the master plan? Yeah, I mean, um, could you, and you've been hinting at some of these things, but could you walk us through, you know, where, where would this whole huge and very complex project start? I mean, you were, you were very confidently talking about megastructure and, and so on. And I, and, we know that already from your previous works and, and yeah, yeah. it is compelling definitely and it's exciting and it's dense and it's, uh, you know, everything is crashing on this side and there's a lot of need and there's a lot of reality check here. Um, but how do, you, how do you start? I mean, what's the most important? Where do you, you know, what do you need to put in first? Uh, I, I would like to uh, say the, the infrastructure, like how to include integrate the, the, the current infrastructure network is very big part of my design. And originally the PKB yard uh, design like a, like, like a yard to put all those uh, kind of stuff, uh, like, uh, like originally it's for distribution. So it makes sense, it, like the, the side itself eager to be a distribution machine, like that kind of thing. So it triggered me to, you know, yeah. It's um, kind of like I, have the desire, like the site itself had the desire to, be, to become a distribution machine. I know, I know. Okay, but let, let, me, let me just hint a little bit more of where I want, to, want you to go. Um, you are aware of um, a lot of Morphosis projects from which you've learned a lot over the past year that they, always propose various phases on how to approach a site, right? Not everything can happen at the same time. And some of the things will probably not even happen and then st your, your project should still be viable and have a reason of being. So my question goes into the direction, what is the most important mission of your proposal? And what do you really wanna make sure that it works and, and how could it get started. If only 20% of your project were to exist, which 20% would it be? Exactly. Uh, Thank oh, you, Eric. Okay, okay. I got it. I got it. Got to keep, um, keep narrowing it down, narrowing it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would like to say, um, because uh, I want to go back to uh, why I wanted uh, to say about the megaphone, because the, the mega structure and the megaphone is a uh, quite different idea. And the, the uh, mega structure part, uh, mega, the definition of mega structure is really the structure. And the definition of the mega structure is that there's a one uh, like a permanent structure, and uh, the uh, the the second part is like a, there's uh, a lot of functional unit. So the permanent uh, structure part, like the very powerful infrastructure part, will uh, build first, and all those kind of parking unit maybe uh, can uh, go second. So uh, so the platform uh, need to go first to uh, the decking. Uh, the, the platform for, for the, the machine. And second, I, uh, we, we need to have the basic component of the, all those uh, distribution uh, part as I described uh, in, in the presentation. And in, in the end, it will be have the, 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 the system parking, that kind of thing, yeah. Could I, could I make a comment? I, um, it may, it's really more of an observation than a criticism, which is that I think what's really uh, distinct, distinct, distinguishing about this project 
is the fact that it, I think you could almost call it post-human. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just, I'm thinking a little bit about the OMA exhibition about the countryside, the hinterland, um, and the fact that uh, the argument is that the that rural areas of the of the world of the planet are being emptied or vacated and being reoccupied by they're being vacated by humans and reoccupied by technology that is agribusiness and i feel that at a certain level this project is representative of that sort even though it's not in the hinterland meaning that it requires very very few people to manage the prod to manage the entire site it's mostly technology and it's extremely light because it's all as I understand it, kind of aeroponic or hydroponic. Um, and therefore it seems like a really good match in terms of programming with the, um, with the rail yards below because it addresses in some ways a lot of Deborah's concerns about the, the cost of, of cleaning up the site because you could literally build this over the rail yards um, and it's much, it wouldn't be nearly as costly as heavy infrastructure that you would be um, that you would that other building types would require, but I, I think there's a kind of strangeness to the fact that it has a very very low human occupancy, but at the same time it's extremely high productivity. Yeah, um, that seems very that seems really essential to what this project is about, and so I think if we're comparing it relative to others on this site, what's interesting to me is really this idea that you um, that you presented at the beginning about the service area. That the, that the catchment of the people who are affected by it has much, much greater reach than any of the other projects. It's almost the opposite of the first project where you put 30,000 people on the site. Here, it's serving 30,000 or more people with a minimum of people on the site itself. And so I think there's something pretty interesting about that, the oddity of that, you know, the fact that nobody would occupy it and yet everybody would be affected by it. If the, uh, if the future agricultural automated Amazon warehouse yeah, writ large, yeah, that's using exactly what it is. buoyant forms that float up above the ground in what, what we could all imagine, and I don't think was shown in the very self-consciously Tron-like graphic presentation, <laughs> an incredible Pyrenesian space underneath with shafts of light coming down in between all of these buoyant forms. I don't know how to, quite how to describe them in, in their language, but this, this project, like the last one or two projects ago, has really changed a lot since, since it was last seen in the midterm. And it's really very interesting. And I agree absolutely with everything Roger said. I think he's spot on. I guess my, my questions, <laughs> since he's kind of answered the, my first question, which was, how do people interact with this? And the answer is, they don't. How does the river, how does this project engage the river? because it formally seems to engage it, but I didn't hear you say anything about what it's doing or how it engages the river. Does that support the story in any way? Uh, in, in the, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in this part, I talk about uh, how, how it uh, function again. Yeah. And I wanted to, um, to answer, uh, answer like the, the Rogers uh, previously, uh, the, 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 the question I agree the I think it, it totally makes sense because the uh, originally in my mind it's kind of like why uh, the the people is not uh, like a lot of people engaging in, in this part because I I think uh, in, in kind of in urban design we need some kind of balance uh, like if we have this kind of powerful uh, distribution machine to uh, increase the equity of the full equity of uh, human and and like uh, solve a lot of problem uh, of a human. So we need like a specific area to, to give the freedom of this machine. Uh, so it's kind of like a balance. Like, like some part will be um, human uh, being a re residential area. Some part will be a very uh, in intense uh, uh, like machine part. So it's kind of like that. And uh, about the second point, I, I want to talk about the because the now the the chain the when we talk about those kind of machine maybe we are related to the, the new infrastructure the new infrastructure maybe is kind of uh, invisible uh, like uh, a lot of thing uh, smart city thing the day surveillance uh, people uh, big data 
and then to create a, a lot of smart, those are the, the new in infrastructure. But why this uh, machine will be so like physically so powerful? Because it served, the, it is the basic human need. Like as long as we are the physical uh, person of the, as a human, we need to eat. So we need food. So that's why we need those kind of machine to distribute uh, those kind of, uh, you know, to increase the uh, full equity of the human. So uh, that's my point for this uh, machine. And then but for Eric's qu uh, question, uh, uh, big, uh, I, yeah, I, I haven't showed the, uh, like, uh, maybe it's my representation uh, uh, problem because uh, I haven't showed a large uh, image of the, this uh, LV uh, distribution system and Alameda COVID distribution system that about uh, maybe when, when we uh, look at the left hand side, we can uh, see the, the, the axon uh, that uh, express the, 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 how we function, like uh, the, those kind of functional component. Yeah, you know, um, Zhao, uh, Zhao has been a, a lesson in how, if uh, if a student is just absolutely uh, obsessed with uh, with one particular kind of uh, notion of something, you just have to uh, try to see like how far that can go. You know, it's like a it's like a, a music student just obsessed with like one riff on the guitar or just one particular instrument. And he's been obsessed with basically infrastructure, especially of a certain type of mega infrastructure, and uh, and infusing that with a certain type of narrative. And and you know, Zhao, actually, if I were to say one thing, um, I'm a little bit amiss with these series of representation because it doesn't do justice to what I know is an insane and overly baroque level of modeling you've done in your actual model. Yeah. That, like uh, Eric said, is actually like a high tech or dead tech Piranesian. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, your Photoshop job, I think, uh, really dilutes uh, your your insane obsession. And I would, you know, if I were to put on my pragmatic hats, sure, it's it's, it's, it's oversized, it's it's gargantuan. It, but you know, there's a level of uh, an absolute obsessiveness that you bring to the table that uh, I kind of like admired. Uh, where mm -hmm. I could pick, I could pick this apart, edit. Uh, I could start editing it out, right? But uh, at this level, it's um, uh, thank you for your energy. Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to answer uh, Yi's question because the uh, right uh, try to decide the, the image or the representation. So you can see the like the, the, the image in the daytime is from the eye of human and the image in the nighttime or like all those perspective actually is the image from the machine. So it will be dark, will be colorful, will be like, so it's kind of like a representation uh, kind of style uh, to choose. Maybe I'm I'm wrong. Uh, I, I I don't know. Thank you for your uh, opinion. Okay, so I think uh, I think that's a perfect way to segue from the the future uh, gaze of the machine to going back to gaze of the humans in downtown LA. So uh, Zhao, thank you very much, and for all the teams on piggyback, thank you very much. We will now segue to our last and third site, which is the LA uh, Downtown Civic Center. And there are two projects. Uh, we will begin with. Um, I think we're. I think Alonzo, I think you're you're closing out. So with uh, with Xiao, let's let's start the project. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yep. Okay. Um. Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is Xiao and Xiu Xi. Uh, let us introduce our Civic Center project, the Workable Engine of Autopia. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Civic Center is one of the business parts of downtown. During the work week, thousands of city, county, state workers fill a dozen plus large office buildings. And for now, a new master development plan presents a holistic version for vibrant mixed use community in this heart of downtown. But in our project, we highly respect the original garment value, but here we are also thinking to rework or transform the site with more citizens activities all day. So in this project, 
we propose to create a vertical village with a green infrastructure in civic center to explore one development of vertical life in future urban. And in this design, we also try to base on the five minute and 10 minute global working standard to structure people's activity in three dimensional. So at first we start our project from the research of program distribution around civic center. And then we did the simulated floor intensity of people staying 24 hours around the site based on the program distribution. We can see um, although it has been provided with a nice public environment, it regresses to a collection of inactive blocks with a low foot traffic beyond work hours. And during working hours, this area has a very high vitality value, especially in the west of civic center. But at night, the activity density becomes really low because there are few attractive points to keep people stay after business hours. Majority of people working here are living out of civic center and even downtown and commuting from home to office each day. Their evacuation after work has become a primary restriction on the level of activities available. And at the same time, we are also concerned about some general downtown screen space situation. Uh, currently, we know the public park space is hardly capable of serving all residents perfectly in Los Angeles. It has a low rate of park space <clears throat> in LA compared with other high density cities in the US. And the situation in downtown is more severe. Although LA County can provide 3.3 acres of public parks per thousand people, it has just about less than 0.4 acres in downtown. So considering reactivating civic center's vitality and also want to improving the green rate in downtown, we are thinking about how to create a vertical village more suitable for people living and could it become a city module which one can be developed in the future. So before our design, we extract the dimension of our site as a really simple module to think about the relationship between workability and verticality. Also, we try to use this module to reorganize the typical urban module to a vertical one, and which one can accommodate 2,400 people. So for now, our basic idea is about centralized space and release space. When we concentrate most of the programs, the open space can expand to two times or more for citizens. And, and then for the centralized mass, the residential units will be site at the external part, while the public human demands will concentrate in the internal space. And also we divided this public space into different categories, um, into different layers, which is limited to four to five story in order to control the time people spend on walking through. We also arrange them from bottom to top based on their program shareability. And when we were exploring this vertical village, we defined it as a macro concentrate urban instead of one architecture. So we believe walkability is one of the most important elements that should be considered. So based on the typical 10 minutes working city concept, we attempted to import the Z axis to discuss 10 minutes working, vertical working city. So we constructed by considering city ground level with the vertical village ground together. And to apply this concept of the vertical module into the design, we subdivided its abstract term of workability and the verticality into three quantified parameters, which are population density and the number of layers and the green rate to balance the relations between workable and the vertical and also test the optimal scale and the location of this vertical module in our site. Based on the project population is 2,400, people, we get a series of modules to show in this diagram. And also according to the reasonable, re, a reasonable aspect ratio and the green rate, we choose five layers, which include one green layer and four functional layers at the module height to develop. And after the exploration of the vertical valley module, when we go into our design, uh, we are also thinking about how our project can be an urban connection linking different parts of downtown. 
So in our site, we extract two main axes on our site based on the age condition. Uh, so the X axis is the, from the county government office building to MOCA, and the Y is from the Caltrans to the historical monument plaza. And we are also using a green infrastructure, which is a significant activation effort that intends to tie together the Little Tokyo commercial street, civic center, and the historical monument to in front of Union Station. We look forward to attracting more people from this high food traffic zone to City Hall. And this green infrastructure also includes retail and restaurants for citizens coming here, and also using this connect to using this to connect the vertical village part and underground in our site. So based on the research of the vertical module, we use it as a bounding box of our vertical village and reshape it by the combinatory design language to merge different programs in the vertical direction. And in this organizational system diagram, you can see at the ground level, we use idea of farm to table restaurant as a program of the lower space, which below the landscape surface to increase people's sense of part participation. Also to activate and keep the vitality value after working hour. And for the upper part, we follow the number of functional layers that we select in the module to organize the public space at the internal part and the residence surround at the external part. And based on the different public demands, each layer are organized vertically according to the shareability and openness. And after entering each layer, these public space are connected by the horizontal working system, which extends from the ground level to the top floor. And in order to ensure the regionality of the connection within the working distance and working experience, we set up a system to generate it automatically, which based on the two principles and then optimize the pathway by two conditions. So when both of these conditions meet the threshold value, the optimal pathway is screened out as a final result. And also at the same time, in order to improve mobile efficiency and balance the relationship between privacy and openness, between housing and the public space, the vertical circulation is composed of four group of core, each with the public and the private one. Public core only stop every two or three floors so people can access to each layer directly and then walk to their target space by this horizontal pathway. And this is our section. In the first section, it shows the differentiation between the residence and the public space. You can see the plaza here in front of the civic center have a direct connection with the vertical village and the open space also could accommodate the civic activity. And in the second section, so you can see the density and openness of the public space decrease from the lower part to the upper part. And there's uh, some cinemas, library, and galleries which have a more openness pro program in the bottom part. And this is a perspective from the historical monument zone to our project. We intend to control the height below city hall and also get a skyline balance in the civic center. And from street view to show a from the southeast corner to connect the surrounding blocks and the Union Station, the continuous landscape surface is tracked above the street to make the site become more accessible. Uh, and at last, we want to use this image to finish our presentation. Um, there are the multiple choices generated from our module in each specific site. We, we are just thinking about how to use this vertical urban module to explore more the explore more relationships between high density and open green space and maybe the workability with the verticality. So maybe if someone can serve to the downtown LA in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, can you guys go back to that first um, rendered view that you showed? Uh, is this one? No, the very, that one's, I like this one, but I was thinking of the very first one that you showed. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. But your project, it's really great to see your project again after so long, because it has changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. Since the midterm, and I think it, what you've done with it is really very, very compelling. It's well thought through. It's, it, um, it functions 
on many levels. And I really feel like you took the criticism that you received at the midterm review very seriously and yeah. really challenged yourself to do something. I don't, I don't have the sense that either one of you have done anything quite like this before or so much maybe that you even knew what you were doing while you were doing it. But the result is even go back more, go back to like slide. You got an eye level view that that one, that one. Yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> I wish you guys had made a movie like walking into this thing and looking up at it. I mean, we had, we talked a lot about how is it related to immediately to the context and you've, you've answered that question. How, how does it function? The form responds to the functions that are in it in ways that are uh, believable, that subdivide a, a giant mass that meets the ground very delicately, also kind of shares with the last project in a way some preoccupation with buoyancy and levitation of forms over a public, in this case, an actually public landscape for people, not a public landscape for ro robots. But yeah, I want to know more about what it's like to be inside that space. I mean, in those public open spaces that are, what'd you say, every five or, or 10 floors? Section one. Yeah, we can show the section. Yeah, the section's were helpful. Mm -hmm. This one. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, we cite some basic uh, public space like the cinema, the swimming pool, uh, the library, sports hall inside of these buildings. Not, maybe not building, it's like a macro urban. Um, and we, we divided this program to the recreational, the sports, the cultural, and the educational, and to um, organize them from the sh bottom to top based on the shareability. So mm -hmm. you can see the cinema is in the, sorry, the cinema is at here, and um, it also has a meeting room, and the gallery is on, in the upper level, and we also have other, um, space like the grocery, maybe it's in the more upper level um, because we think maybe the grocery is uh, served to the residents who lives here, but cinema is for the all citizens in the, sure. in the downtown, yeah. So all of these eccentrically shaped spaces in section are these notionally sem public and semi-public amenities that you, that you uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. And they're distributed in yeah, different yeah. ways throughout the interior of the building. What's the one that's punched into the ground? Um, oh, you've, you've labeled it. I didn't see the labeling. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's showing in this diagram. Uh, yeah, we, we set that as a, a farm to table restaurant. So it can have more uh, reaction with the citizens about the landscape surface. So people can have more sense of participa participation. So it maybe can keep people after the working hour, which we want to restore that the diagram showing at the very beginning that the mm -hmm. uh, vacancy of the night. So that's. I have a question about the title, the walkable engine of Autopia. And I didn't somehow get it in the presentation. Um, uh, what? What is walkable about the project? Is it, is it the fact that there's vertical urban space and it's about proximity? Mm. As, as the use of Autopia, are you kind of making fun of that? Um, is, that is it a sense of humor or can you explain it a little bit more for me? Um, because we are thinking, we are thinking Los Angeles is not a city, it's which one is not really pedestrian friendly. So when we think about this vertical village, we are thinking about could we to concentrate all human demands into one box? And this one is like a walkable city. Like we can get every demands in um, 400 meters walking or 800 walking. So this engine is like a macro concentrated urban, maybe can uh, plug into the downtown everywhere. And it's like some small pins, but into this Los Angeles, this big utopia. So we created this 
we we give this title to our project. Yes, and also that we don't want to like force people to working to working to by the by working, but also there is a if we have this model as an anchor point in the downtown LA, the working will become a kind of primary mobility option for people instead of mm, moving by cars. That's what I see. I think. Okay, so so I think the answer then is uh, well, I mean, what you just just described is also <laughs> what mall is, you know, a kind of compressed interior space of of public space, but. Um, I think a little bit like the last project, which I didn't have a chance to comment on, the use of uh, machine, or in this case, engine, I find interesting, um, and maybe it's more in the studio. Uh, at times it's used in a way that I have to say is, um, in the last project, it was more an aesthetic, I think, like things that look like pipes and kind of technology are used to create a kind of sense of, of the machinic? Because at, at no point does anyone explain to me how the machine works, which I find interesting. So it's like, I'm wondering like in the previous scheme, what he wanted to get out of the jury. Because if I, if I show something to a bunch of experts, I want to know their opinion on whether or not, you know, like if you're an engine designer, for instance, you, you, you want, the engineers at Ferrari uh, to, 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 to give comment on it. And they'll say, no, 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 you got the carburetor all wrong, you know, and you should try doing it this way or that way or whatever, any, any kind of. So, so uh, with, with this project though, I think you're more developed and more specific with that. And so with you, I would say, where are the points and maybe it's that section drawing um, that you were showing, if you could go to the section. Like, where is the part where, in my machine analogy, where do I walk and how do I walk to access vertical public space in a way that's very different than a traditional city, which would be horizontal, and we would go from sidewalk to park to building lobby, let's say, as a definition of one sense of public space. So I think it's happening. Um, and I'm going to use my little annotate here, um, if you don't mind. I think it has to do with these parts that Eric was asking about, like that public space and this public space and the kind of linking, right? Mm -hmm. That I get to kind of walk, if this is the walkable engine against Autopia, I think. I don't think it's of Autopia. It's like, you, you, you're, I would be more critical of that. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, this is the answer that LA needs that it could never solve because of its horizontal uh, spread out nature that this, that, that in fact, it wasn't, wasn't about uh, making the city more dense that would create it walkable. This is another kind of new kind of model. Um, and so I, I, I just, I think it, the, 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 the title for me was difficult to kind of get around, mm -hmm. uh, but, but there are, as Eric said, I mean, that, that view, I think what's powerful about the exterior views are these slices through the building. I somehow, I don't think they're tall enough. They seem too horizontal, like uh, a little bit, but um, I want to make them maybe eh, a little bit bigger uh, as public space, because if they get embedded in this in this kind of building that they're, I'm afraid there would be a little bit um, proportionately um, thin. You know, when I look at I, it- Let me ask Eric, I oh, can answer. Okay, go ahead. Your question also that the uh, <clears throat> pedagogically <clears throat> totally aware and that moving these people immensely over their heads. And I'm somehow comfortable with that. These are my babies. And if you'd have seen the work they came in with, I don't, hey, you guys, I forgot it. our first conversations. I don't think you'd ever stepped in an architectural office. And um, the speed of which they've um, developed both organizationally and clearly formally is, um, is just astounding. But I'm somehow comfortable with the fact that um, maybe five years from now, they'll look at this and themselves be startled at what it is or is it? And Absolutely. they'll understand it. <laughs> it's just, yeah. And it's yeah. um, kind yeah. of amazing me. And I actually, it's been a very 
pleasurable for me to watch these two grow at what I thought was just an astounding rate. And I'm completely comfortable that they don't have to understand. Um, and I'm also kind of fascinated with the power of architectural language and its ability to communicate complex ideas of which they can um, grasp without understanding the total implications. And um, yeah. the power of that is just, if I find it totally fascinating. This is for me a kind of a, I've taught for a few years. It's a kind of a validation in some way of, of, of certain aspects of how we teach. Hmm. I do well, want that, to say- All of that okay. is palp palpable and I don't think I would appreciate, I certainly wouldn't appreciate it in the same way you do. And I wouldn't appreciate it at all if I had not seen it in the mid review. Oh, I do want to say before I, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, but at six o'clock I have to I have to take off. But since I've been following these students for the whole year, and I'm sure I was going to save it for final comments, but Tom, I think you bring it up. You know, we've, I've seen incredible growth among this group uh, from what was a kind of interesting, kind of shaky start in a lot of ways. I think there was challenges on both sides uh pedagogical and otherwise and uh i have seen uh, uh well i just saw, see a lot of learning i see a lot and a lot of ability i think uh the work uh again over the over the year since it was almost exactly a year ago uh, you guys started uh is, is quite impressive and i think each semester had different challenges and that was absolutely that's absolutely clear and i know this is a different scale than than the first, you know, the first projects in Spain and, 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 and the second mm -hmm. one. So uh, I think that's great. Tom, uh, we're always gonna have this discussion between the, um, the aesthetic, let's say, or the, um, the formal versus, you know, how, you know, that is deployed in let's say tangible ways. So sometimes what I'm saying is not a matter of, is it in there or not? And I think, like in this project, it's there. It's maybe a critique of how the projects are presented in a way like, you know, well, it's just, you know, you just assume that it works, you know? And I think and some of these students have like the last one who E points out like this model's so robust and no one knows it because it was it was shown in a certain kind of way, you know? And and, and he, he wants to, to, to encourage that, that student to, to show it differently. So I think, I think some of it has to do with how the conversation goes and what and I always feel that students should be empowered to try to control the discussion that they want to have by what they bring up and what they show so that was my only point not that it doesn't necessarily exists but that it's not always highlighted in the presentations now John we'll continue this conversation but <clears throat> I see the the formal is actually um, a contamination in many cases because the, the broader notion is that the formal was a, a provocation and um, it, it had to find an alignment with the uh, obligatory and the performative. And that's a, a huge task that um, is been, mm -hmm. I, I've overestimated that possibility and it'll be a continuing conversation that we'll have with this group of students still before they leave in terms of this relationship with the two. And they move very, very quickly on the formal. I was kind of shocked at how quickly they kind of moved at that level. And I'm now rethinking myself, kind of this, this whole notion of, of the early, um, hmm, um, the, the involvement in, in, in the, the formal language at an earlier stage. And I'm, it's something that we're talking about. Well, I think the other thing about the design portion, it's a little bit um, of a kind of, um, afterward to what to what John was talking about is that it seems as though the design has accidentally or not fallen into some solutions to some of the things that were originally posed but not deliberately for instance um, walkability was was talked about or even diagrammed in such a way that it had to do with a distance from the building as opposed to walkability being built into the building, which is what John was talking about. Yes. So likewise, open space was talked about as being a shortage in LA, but it's not necessarily the open, the, in the project, the open space outside of the building is not what's interesting. The idea is how the building itself, instead of being not open space, actually adds to open space 
through the voids that are being created. And I'm not talking about the ones that are inside the figures. I'm talking about the residual space that like a pachinko is falling through the building um, and is still literally open air so that you could actually say that you have an impossible, that you've solved an impossible equation of densifying while also increasing open space. Well, while traditionally the calculus is that densification leads to less open space, to a reduction, you've actually gotten more open space through densification, if that makes sense. So I'd like to actually have put a centrifuge to your section and show how certain things come out as being building uh, additional net square footage. Other things come out as being open space and other things come out as being circulation, meaning pedestrian and how those things statistically circle back to the premise, the data-based premise of, of what you started out doing. I think right now what you haven't done is look back at what you've created and do a kind of post-mortem to see that you've actually accidentally addressed some of the things through a, a rear door. Interesting, Roger. I agree with you totally. I thought it was overscaled. I would have filled the open space. Mm-hmm. And not use that's the traditional notion and got doing, going exactly where you're saying is the most interesting provocation. Not yep. in space that's already been done and simple, right? <clears throat> and it's overscaled. They could solve other problems doing that and increase density. I think in that uh, in that note, in terms of uh, open space and uh, provocation, I think we should all segue to the last uh, <laughs> presenter, who is the anarchist in the group. And uh, <laughs> I, I apologize that we might be uh, losing our vice director, John. But um, Alonzo, uh, you're going to pull, uh, you're going to be now the relief pitcher. And uh, this is the last one. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the comments. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, yeah. guys. Congratulations. Well, well, I think it's kind of funny that I'm labeled the anarchist of the class. Of course, uh, of course. I, I, have to, I have to keep the group together. Well, I've I, I've swapped my uh, my opening slide for something a little bit more provocative to uh, to keep things spicy at the end. Um, let's um, how do I do this? Okay, so yeah, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you hear me correctly? Sometimes when my my microphone. Yes. doesn't work and I sound like a ransom message. No. Yes, yes. Well, okay. Make it very succinct for the sake of everybody, uh, make it strong. I'll keep it <laughs> short but powerful. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Awesome. So I've been holding on to this image since the start of the term. The term. So this is my project in a nutshell. I, I did not do that graffiti, but I took a picture of it. It's right in front of City Hall. I think it's hilarious. I am not affiliated to Antifa or any sort of radical movement by any, by the way. I'm actually quite conservative. Um, okay, so uh, this project is uh, is called the the Civic Center Co-op. That's how I'm branding it, uh, and and it is meant to be very provocative. Uh, it's meant to, to to really challenge the way in which we think of the typology of what a civic center should be. I see it as a great opportunity to rethink a lot of the dynamics between uh, government and people. Uh, so let's dive briefly into history. Uh, in the past. 100 years, there have been 30 master plans for the Civic Center, and all of them have had the same problem. It's that um, uh, the, 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 um, the layouts have always consisted of uh, blocks of buildings, you know, the masses arranged over the um, void of the ether, and the emphasis is always then on the building and not on the public space, which should be uh, more important. Uh, just a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, um, just a sec. Um, right. Okay. So we have a century of uh, master plans that have all been done to exalt the monumentality of government buildings over the importance of public space. So what I want to fundamentally argue is that a civic center is so much more than just a government district. It is a place where the government has the opportunity to actually engage the governed and to display the city's democratic values. Uh, however, the space where this can actually happen, which is a civic plaza, is uh, always reduced to a leftover between buildings and is dealt more as a space from which to admire the monumentality of the buildings rather than a place to interact with them. And a case in point, we have this, uh, 
this picture from the 1960s, where the grandiosity of, uh, of Grand Park that we have now, you see that it was actually a parking lot, which wasn't even conceived as such. Uh, so we have, uh, what, what we're seeing is that there's generations over generations of uh, kind of um, spontaneous planning of all the empty spaces uh, in the Civic Center. And, um, and, and they've, so they've been consistently treated as afterthoughts rather than as drivers for the design. So uh, this would be the modern counterpart of that picture. Uh, what should be LA's most defining civic space is a homeless encampment. Uh, now this is uh, very authentic and revealing in the use of public space, but I'm not comfortable with public space just defaulting into whatever it needs to be, uh, especially in the midst of what's being called the largest protest in US history, while also in the worst pandemic in hundred years. Just, you know, this picture uh, yesterday, so it again, it's twice as large and now it's full of uh, Black Lives Matter posters. Uh, the, <clears throat> so the problem with the Civic Center is that, uh, is that it's just treated as a symbol. And it sounds very nice, you know, that the Civic Center should be, uh, should be evocative of, uh, of civism, but this is a very real space where government and citizens can physically connect. And the such public space should not be a leftover void but it should be the most forward-thinking, daring, and thoughtfully designed space in the whole city. But uh, yet we have to ask ourselves, uh, what good is public space when only the marginalized can see it as theirs? And what good is public space when it is shut down when it's needed the most? These barriers outside the LAPD uh, are still up there. Uh, so the theme of the studio is equity. I, I, I wanna argue that what the city needs most urgently is civic equity and namely the strengthening of the bond between a people and its government and of the rights and duties that both need to internalize to make a city prosper. So the transformation that I hope to catalyze requires a reinvention of the civic center as a typology. So let's see our site. Um, this is the strictly the boundaries of the site, but I'm extending it over to the light orange area here. So, uh, the classical way of solving a city center would imply just stacking the program. Uh, this is what's been done over hundred years. Just build uh, buildings, uh, have them be vertical and then be the, uh, have the civic space, which is defined as part of the program in the current, um, in this uh, civic center master plan is just the remnant void. And uh, if we look at the actual master plan, you'll see that it's exactly that. And this bears very little change from all those 30 master plans that have been going on for, for, for the past hundred years. So we're gonna look at this little plaza here. This one is, is exactly the same as one in a 1920s uh, master plan. So have we really evolved so little that we are still going back to these same forms? So I, I wanna propose that we do things completely different. And I mean, completely different. Uh, <clears throat> the first step is to take the government office program those uh, 200,000 square meters at 150. Uh, and, uh, but it's 200 because I'm including the government program inside city hall and the US courthouses. So I bumps it up a bit and spreading it thin horizontally all over uh, the site as a foundational level. Uh, from a real estate vantage, which is one of the master plan's current drivers, this works really well because it provides an optimal horizontal connections between government offices and allows the airspace above roads to become valuable real estate when bridged. Uh, and uh, because it's at the ground level, it, it remains accessible to citizens. Most importantly, however, it transforms the perception of the government building from a standalone tower to the sublime uh, massing. Uh, it, it relinquishes the classical monumentality in lieu of a magnitude that is true to the ontological scale of government. Uh, even though he consistently calls me an anarchist. I mean, I'm not trying to bring down the government. I'm trying to reveal it in, a, in, in, in its uh, Leviathanic uh, glory, but with a different form. The form of the monument, I argue, is not valid today anymore. So City Hall is no longer something that you can take in with one selfie. Uh, the next step is to relocate the civic space uh, on top of this government mass. So uh, on top of this, this uh, horizontal plinth, I've uh, located um, uh, not only housing and specifically cooperative housing, not so much because of its uh, social connotations, but because of the change in mindset that cooperative housing implies in understanding that sharing and living community is a better way of living into the future. So um, 
<clears throat> there's uh, there's there's housing these housing bars and uh, there's a lot of uh, ancillary uh, government program, uh, social services, a lot of cultural programs, for, uh, spaces for NGOs for community activities, which are located on top of that previous government mat. And then on top of that, we have our new civic space, which before was just 7,500 square meters of a leftover plaza, and now it has its uh, greatest possible extension over this whole sublime mass. If you consider that downtown LA has a really, really poor ratio of, of um, square meters of green area per person, then this is a great way of maximizing that and, and, and taking that ratio back up to, to, uh, to normal standards. Um, in, uh, if we compare the program of what's the, um, the Civic Center Master Plan towards this one, it mainly keeps some of the same factors, like the retail is exactly the same. The culture, I've, I've, uh, I've bumped up the, the cultural program, but, but housing uh, is uh, from the 100,000 uh, square meters that it has. Now I've uh, complemented it with temporary housing, which is a way of, uh, you know, for, uh, or transition housing for, for the homeless, a way of literally taking them off the street. And then there's some, comp there's a part of the housing program has an additional 15,000, uh, 1500 square meters of, uh, 15,000 square meters of, of commons, which we'll look into later. And this is the most important part, the civic space, which was 7,500 square meters, now is a civic park, which is 60,000 square meters. Uh, this is the, uh, this is the top view of the program, of the, of the project. It's um, the, I've, ba, 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 ba. Just a second. Getting lost in my notes. Well, I'll just add a little bit. Uh, here I've been using uh, the um, the um, uh, combinatory design uh, because it's been very useful to collide all these different programs in a new unprecedented way. It's also uh, given me an opportunity to factor in urban uh, elements into this composition. Like uh, for instance, how the, this map connects to the spaces around it, connects to the access around Grand Park, to the plazas that try to form around the Caltrans building and the, and the NYPD building and the LAPD building and, uh, and uh, this uh, plaza behind the little Tokyo. Uh, it also gives me the scale, what is the historical scale of a public space. If we consider that Los Angeles was founded in El Pueblo Plaza here, that is the same module that I've used to create or to recreate different uh, public spaces uh, uh, within this project. And uh, additionally, just uh, formally, you'll notice now that, now that we see some images that all the different uh, volumes that are actually, that are either added or subtracted are all, are, are all oriented towards El Pueblo, which is a way of um, a historic link towards that, uh, the historic value of that place. So let's look at uh, just a, sch a schematic vision of how, uh, how it's seen from, from the top. This is, uh, this is that great big, mat with a big roofscape, uh, which becomes a new public space. Um, you'll see that uh, there is this, uh, these first three stories are the government's program. Uh, because this is so massive, I've taken the trouble of breaking this down in scale. This was one of the very important uh, feedback from the midterm about, the, about how big should this be. So because these are massive blocks, I've broken them down to 100 meter modules with internal streets for the government, which we'll, which we'll see in a while. Um, then um, this is a view of looking south and you'll see that uh, City Hall, it, now the, the monumentality of City Hall and the US courthouses is subsumed within this large mass. There is a deliberate attempt not to destroy monumentality. I mean, I could argue that this whole project is a new form of monumentality, but to take that standalone monument and kind of make it, uh, weave it into something bigger. Uh, you also notice that the levels uh, in which we're at here uh, also match the levels of the plinth at City Hall, so as to reduce that visual size from it from, from just the the top part. Uh, this is the part that extends over to uh, to Grand Park, uh, because there is an existing access here, and the um, and there is a, a very nice perspective from uh, the LA uh, the WP building. Uh, down onto City Hall, uh, this this access uh, that we're seeing here uh, it it, it uh, works as a way of articulating the different episodes that occur uh, in the pro in, in the project as you go along it. One of the parts that's um, 
that uh, that actually works quite well is that uh, because of the ground level and because of the topography level, uh, this top part of the project is actually uh, at the same street level. Whereas if you continue that platform all the way to the back here, uh, you'll find yourself 25 meters above ground level. Uh, now in the midterm, we, uh, we saw some uh, reference projects which have provided a very valuable feedback on how to, how to make this project better. Uh, first one is this project in Albany, which tries to do something similar. Once again, the, the, big, uh, the big sublime mass, but it presents a challenge of aliena alienation. How do you create this big uh, plaza that's above the street level and at the same time make, make it accessible and, and make it feel like part of the city? This project was heavily criticized because uh, nobody ended up going up here, it created problems for the building underneath, and it ended up segregating both sides. Uh, then there's a speculation about how would it actually work if you take people off the streets, especially now with protests happening all the time. You know, how do those pro how would those protests uh, occur now in this new typology? Now that people are sharing the same space, you know, the space in which they live is the same space in which the government works. Now that there isn't a building that you can look up to and wave your fist at, but you would actually have to look down at, how would that, how would that work? So uh, it's easy to just leave it blank and to say that that is something that could be speculated on, but I've tried to, um, but, but I've attempted a, a form of protest in this new typology. Then there is uh, pragmatics. There's a 25 meter difference. And it's very, um, it could be uh, easy to gloss over that and to just say that, well, you know, people will go up there. But if you're walking your dog out there, then what, may, what will compel you to go up, uh, up, up to that um, new uh, civic park? Uh, that height difference is the same one as a women's university in Seoul. Uh, and so this was uh, a valuable reference to see what would uh, uh, the, the correct scale and slope and gradient of a ramp be in order to make a space inviting. And uh, the fourth challenge is, is that of just being content with making this symbolic. If we, uh, if we look at the Foster, uh, Foster's project in the Reichstag, it has all this narrative about people going up there and being able to reflect their images down into the parliament. But you know, being there, you hardly see anything. It's much, it, it, it sounds a lot better in the magazine or in the book than actually being there. And I don't want to be content, content with this just being a nice idea, but one which in practice would be infeasible. Uh, so, uh, Here's a schematic section going all along the axis of Grand Park. And this is the part I was mentioning earlier. You have to take out your uh, magnifying glass for this. Uh, but you'll see that the, the level here, which is at roughly 25 meters above the street level over here, is the same level. So if you're actually walking onto the project from Grand Park and you go right through it, you cross uh, City Hall while you're piercing through it. We'll see that in a while uh, through a bridge. And then you end up in, uh, on the park on the other side you'll have that surprising effect that, oh, well, now I'm no longer at street level. Now I need to go down seven stories in order to go back to the floor, uh, to the ground level. So that's kind of nice. Uh, then if we zoom in a little bit more, this is the ramp. Uh, this allows us to see the ramp that I'm proposing in order to reach that rooftop level. Uh, this will be easier to see in, in, in renderings, uh, but it's just so that you kind of get a technical uh, vision of it. And then finally, uh, this is a, a cut through uh, this kind of end, end part here, where uh, this is a kind of typical where we have a, the first three stories are that government mass. And then in this case, for instance, I've uh, cut the government here, and the, I've cut that mass in the center so as to provide a trench to provide, that will uh, provide not only an internal street for the people with proper clearance to go through, like from one uh, government office to another, which is a, a, a very positive point in this uh, idea of wanting to integrate and, and, and make uh, the, um, the government as, as, as seamless and efficient as possible, but also provides good light, uh, light and air uh, for, for this part here. So we have that big first plinth, uh, government plinth here, and then we have the second level where this is the transitional housing. Uh, and uh, we'll also see that up close. But here we have uh, housing bars, we have uh, basketball courts, here we have the, the grand hall for, for town halls. And on top of that, then we have our park, which is the one that covers everything. Um, if, if this is an axon view of the whole project, uh, it's in order to understand the scale of it, 
uh, it's I've, I've cut it up into five zones. One endpoint here is uh, is more of a community area. It is it has uh, the large auditorium, which is connected, which is closer to the LA Philharmonica and to the Opera House and and, and the big auditoriums on the other uh, up the road. Uh, it's also uh, predominantly open, so that it integrates as best as possible with uh, with 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 Grand Park. Here, there's a cut up uh, and exploded axioms of every single uh, level. Just so you know, there's a monstrous amount of, of, of detailing that's gone into my model just to make sure that everything works all the way from the circulation course to how this is structured, to how uh, we get light and air into every single space. Uh, because we don't have much time, I'm just gonna leave this so that we can go back to it if we wanna talk about it. Um, the second part is where housing is concentrated. Uh, in one of the original schemes, housing was on top of the park, but that really blocked the view to the city from that, that um, elevated and privileged vantage uh, 25 meters above ground. So it's kind of subsumed under that mass, but it, it, it does kind of wave up and, and grab City Hall in, 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 the, um, in the process. These are the two spaces, the two voids that I've left to give some wiggle room for, uh, for City Hall and the, and the courthouses. And uh, for instance, here is that bridge that kind of pierces through City Hall, uh, taking you from one side to the other. Uh, also, every single housing unit has been developed uh, to detail. Uh, this, this is to have the level of uh, uh, comfort knowing that this could work uh, with, with some more uh, time. Uh, then across on the other side, uh, we have the more institutional uh, area. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, if in a mass that is so big, how do you orient yourself? How do you find what the main door is? If you're new in town and you want to go to City Hall, I mean, how do you, where's the front door? So this is the area that concentrates the biggest openings and the biggest connection points between ground level and the top level. This is where that uh, previous uh, section was uh, showing that slope. Uh, and this uh, matches with the uh, plaza in front of the Caltrans building and the connection to Union Station over here across the 101 freeway. Uh, considering that 40% of people that work in downtown LA uh, go there every day through Union Station, this is gonna be one of the main entrance points, especially for government workers. Uh, again, everything solved to the detail. Uh, then we have uh, the social services uh, section. Uh, this, uh, again, we have uh, the scheme of the um, uh, bottom plinth with government offices, uh, government and retail on the first floor. And then we have two, two floors for transition housing and for community services. All of this at the same time is covered by that roofscape so that there is a tension between people kind of walking their dog or gathering or just you know reading a book under the shade of a tree at the top and knowing that there's a lot of life that's happening underneath all these little points that you see here all these perforations those are light wells to not only uh, provide some extra light and, and air into those uh, activities underground but to also remind the people on the surface of all the activities that are happening underneath uh, in, in that sense, this project is, it, it does have a very faculty narrative uh, because uh, there is this constant tension between the people that are being watched uh, by the ones on top and the ones on top watching the ones underneath. So there is this kind of watchman watching over other watchmen uh, tension and, uh, and which I see as an opportunity to blur the line between uh, the representatives, uh, that's the government and the people they represent. Uh, again, this is completely solved. And, uh, and finally, we have the cultural land. This part here, that fits snugly into a, a, a lot at the end of Little Tokyo. Uh, and it's meant to match the, si the, the height of the, um, of the urban profile of, of the existing buildings, the existing environment over there. And that will be the end point of this, of this long axis. Uh, once again, this, is, this kind of works. So, uh, Okay, how does this look? And I've, I've chosen- uh, uh, Let's go through these. Okay, yes. Uh, I've chosen a collage as the best form of representing, uh, of representing the project. So this is kind of one of, one of the uh, most important views, which is what do you see uh, down Grand, uh, Grand Park? Uh, here, uh, rather than um, once again, demolishing the monument or, or doing something that goes, that's contrary to that Versailles-esque feel of, of Grand Park, 
uh, I've tried to be subtle here. And, and remember, this is, a, this is a mass that is meant to blend in and to be monumental because of its size, but not because of its form. Uh, you even see that the rooftop of a Starbucks here, a two-story building, is actually at the same level or seems at the, to project at the same level as this uh, first mass that covers the, the, the top two plinths of, of, of City Hall. Yeah, uh, this uh, this part here is uh, is that beginning of the roofscape that uh, covers the entrance to the subway station, uh, the Civic Center, and this part here, which looks perforated, is actually uh, an optical illusion because since I'm keeping this bridge at level, then uh, it reveals the very steep topography that exists right now in the site. Uh, then if we're talking about that main entrance point. How does one find where, 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 where you go in? Uh, I've put in a main welcome center to the whole government uh, uh, mass up here. And it is the same uh, route that you would take to go up to the park. Um, so more, if, you, if you get off at this level, then you go into the government and into the government circuit in which you connect across the bridge you know, to both sides. Uh, and if you continue going one level above, then you're up in the park. So it's that uh, idea of, of getting, of, uh, of having one point that really brings everyone together. Also notice that the scale of this aligns with uh, the scale of, uh, of, the Caltrans, uh, of the Caltrans Plaza. And it's something that is large enough for one to intuitively uh, understand that this is where you get in. Uh, additionally, thinking about how one protests, I mean, having a slope is a great way of, uh, of, um, of uh, depicting a protest. If you're at ground level, the only way in which you can see how many people are there are with a drone or somebody taking a neural picture. If you're in a slope, then you can really see at one glance the amount of people that are there uh, uh, protesting. And uh, also as a little fun fact, this is the mayor's office, according to my layout. So it's a, it's, it's a good place to, uh, to have that uh, visual interaction. Uh, this is a view from Union Station. And here, rather than highlighting any particular form of, of this mess, I want to highlight how the, the fact that there is a mass of this scale and of this extent in the first place really decreases the, the monumentality of City Hall and, and, and the U.S. courthouses. Uh, this is a point where that 40% of people that uh, enter downtown LA through, the, through Union Station would just uh, kind of go through this ramp and, and go straight into, that, uh, into, into the project. And uh, one more, and you know, these are deliberately pedestrian. If 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 you're if you if you're uh, if you're asking, or if you're thinking about it, uh, you know, because this is uh, an urban project, this is not so much about the form, but about the necessity to reinvent the typology. Uh, one thing I will say about the form, though, is that uh, there uh, in the design, I've I've put in these little bars that actually work as inver inverted cantilevers. Uh, in the Caltrans building. This is a, 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 a wink to my professors and Tom, I hope you appreciate this one. Uh, they actually, uh, they do mark the same level, uh, the same topography level as the one in Caltrans building. And they use them sporadically across uh, the, that rooftop, not only as a, as a bookend, so people don't fall off, uh, but also to show the different, uh, to, to reveal the different uh, height differences. Uh, as that topography in the in the um, in the park uh, goes up and down, and then finally, this is a view from that park space, from that civic park. Uh, here you see uh, City Hall kind of crowning this at the background, but you see that's no longer the main piece of this composition. I mean, this is a place where you can see the city anew, where uh, the the park is now the new ground level of the LA Phil in the background where you can see the, the, the skyscrapers and you can see the buildings in the, and from a perspective that you've never been able to see before. And also this is a place in which you can kind of gather around this border and see the interior life of what's happening in the government buildings. Um, so there is this uh, uh, um, scale of having a new like uh, breathing and open space for people to gather in. But at the same time, it is uh, impossible to dissociate with all the activity that's happening underneath. Um, and as a, as a final note, this I'll return from the, I'll repeat it from the okay, midterm. Let's try to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, okay, so a final note on, 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 the, on the current attempts of City Hall to be cosmetic. I mean, right now, City Hall tries to be approachable just by dyeing its, its colors. 
uh, when something important happens uh, in, in, in this project uh, by hollowing out City Hall and leaving it empty and, and, as, and, and part of this um, uh, episodic route from one side to the other, then you're leaving it open so that it can take the use that society needs it to have in the, in the future according to, to circumstances. So uh, as an example, if there's a pandemic, you know, you, you can take out this, you can take the solid out shell and use it for hospital rooms. If there's need for uh, food, you can, you, you can fill it with hydroponics. If, uh, um, and uh, so it, and so the idea would be for it to constantly be adapting its use to what the city needs. And that would be a great way of, of transforming a, a monument into current needs. Okay, that's... Uh, Lanza, well, why don't you just finish with a, 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 an image you haven't shown us yet, which is just an overall accent. It's the one classic image you've shown in, in all the previous reviews, but you haven't shown it here. Uh, okay. Uh, can I do this one? Why don't you? You don't have the one that you've always shown, which is like the full thing all together with the city hall? Uh, let, uh, I can use this one. I have as an annex some run. This is it all coming together. I think we can use this one. Great. Hey, listen, I've got to jump in here because I've got a public meeting yep. in, in eight minutes and, and I really appreciate um, the level of work. When I say the level of work, the intensity of your effort. I think that you're a very talented and smart person. I think that you've actually engaged um, some of Tom's some of Tom's work over the years, and I and I think that one of the things I admire about Tom is the evolution of his work. And I don't really want to go into this too much here, but I actually have to say this is one of the saddest projects I've ever seen presented, and I'm saying that as somebody who respects your intelligence, and I'll tell you why because. I think you have a very, very misguided notion. And my dog obviously disagrees with me, but um, I think you have a kind of misguided notion about what you're trying to do here. And you're so intelligent, but you're also so shooting yourself in the foot all the time. So I'll just tell you the things that I really care about that I miss here. One is that the only ground that exists in this place, and I mean ground where you can plant something, a tree, or something like that, you've destroyed. And that's basically the land to the south and to the north of City Hall. Everything else is elevated or sitting on top of parking garages. That's a huge loss. That's a, and it's also a loss because those are the places that when you know there was Occupy Los Angeles, that was the ground in which they occupied. So you've basically destroyed the remainder of the palimpsest of one of the more memorable protests that existed in Los Angeles. I also think that your views are just really giveaways. Like, and, and, may, and I'll, I'll be fully admitting, I've spent a lifetime trying to figure out how to make streets places that people can actually be on and be comforted on. And in the sense of their bodily sense of scale, their sense of wealth, them, their sense of being able to be free within those streets. And you've basically completely destroyed them all the way. And I mean, you've basically made this assumption that you can elevate the world up there, create this rooftop park, get it to make the connections. But you yourself kind of, I think in the end, destroy your whole argument when you sat there towards the end. And you said that there was this tension that existed between the ground plane and what was above. And the fact that there was a blur, you wanted to blur it, or maybe there was a blurring but you admitted to the tension. And the real tension is quite frankly, is that you've got all these very, very singular access points and you can close them all down. There is, this thing is not really permeable in, in the end. And then I'm gonna say something nice about the project, which is that I've always thought that in all the schemes for the last 15 or so, 20 years of the Civic Center, that they've completely missed the sort of utopian beauty of the Los Angeles Mall where they adopted a lot of the strategies that you're talking about, the horizontality, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it was, it's buried over there where you've got your office building. But I've always wondered why nobody ever wanted to go back and try to figure out how to put all of the public access points and touch points which government needs within that space and figure out how to redesign it, create the ramps down to it, 
et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna end on a positive note and just say, I think a lot of the strategies you're working with are powerful strategies. They can be utilized, but I just feel like, oh God, I, I would love to spend like two days debating this whole thing with you and, and, and see if I could convince you to sort of take a lot of your intelligence and a lot of your creativity and um, direct it in a way that um, actually achieved some of the things that I think are admirable that you want to achieve. I, I would welcome that debate. And uh, I disagree on some things. Uh, well, sure, I, that's cool. Of course. Um, uh, do we have time to talk about that or do you have to? No, I, I think you should. I'm sure that other people here will offer you either much more mature and perspectives than I have or um, much more creative suggestions of how to accomplish some of the things that are the strategies or tactics that you are playing with, because I think some of them are, are essential in understanding how architecture can create a framework for gathering which is within the public realm. And that allows people to come together and express themselves in ways that are beyond the control of the state or beyond the control of social mores, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're all after. But I, I just unfortunately don't think you did it yet, but I, I think you desire to do it. And I really hope, seriously, last thing I'm saying, I really hope 10 years from now, you'll still be an architect because we need architects who are playing around with the ideas like you are, but man, it's a really hard game to play. I hope so too. Um, okay, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, add, I'll, I'll add one thing to, to kind of keep it brief, but I would want to follow you up on, on discussing this for, uh, further. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the tension in a, in a public space as something that is detrimental to it. I think that public space is evolving. And um, oh, what was more- The tension is that you notice the observed versus the, um, the hoi polloi. That's basically what you described, that there were the people at the ground level capable of being observed by the ones above. And that whole issue of basically surveillance is probably the number one issue that exists in the creation of public space at this point. And you've basically ended up designing a fortress that has the capacity to surveil what's below it and could control the points of access to it. You know, and, John, and, and it's really problematic. But that, that's what I like about it. I mean, that, that, was, that, that was a point. I know you like it. <laughs> and that's okay. And I understand that. I think there's a lot to debate about how to do this well. I just don't think that it's that easy. I, I think it's, not, it's problematic. The soul example is beautiful, by the way. The what, sorry? The soul example, the, the school project in mm -hmm. Seoul. Yeah. It's easier if you're going down, though. Um, the, OK, oh, well, I, I think sur surveillance is one of the, the, the big themes in, in, of this generation. And uh, maybe just to, 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 to make the, the conversation provocative about what, our, what role architecture is going to have in surveillance. Uh, I think it's uh, it's it, it's been worth doing this as an exploration. Uh, personally, I, I I feel that there there um, this is an invitation to embrace that eventually the only form of social control that we'll have within a democracy is with a partial surrender and a reciprocal surrender of of surrendering yourself, but all, but when when others also surrender themselves. To, uh, to, to uh, this kind of mutual surveillance dynamics. And I think this could be a great platform for that. Uh, but that, that is speculative. But, I, but generally, I do believe that's where, yeah. that's where things are, are, are heading to. And, and I guess that's why this, this makes less sense to me. Um, well, I really respect, I have to run, unfortunately, but I really respect what you've done, Tom. I think you've done a fantastic job. You sung you as well. I, I, I think that I actually think this is the best set of projects that I've seen in terms of their legibility and their preciseness um, that you guys have done. I, I, I was moved by the quality of the work and, and the depth of um, exploration and all of them, even the ones that I reacted, you know, maybe overreacted to, but I, I really do appreciate what you've done and, and, and admire it. And thank you so much for letting me be a part of the conversation.
success. Oh, so thanks much. a lot. Really okay, appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, John. So I, I just would like to say a few things. Um, this is an area of the city that I have thought a lot about. Um, Alonso, I would um, echo what, what, what John just said, which is your intelligence is, is clearly uh, represented here. But if you were concerned, as you said initially, about people uh, not seeing government as a Leviathan, I, I don't understand how this would change that perception. And I feel like, and I also, I, I practically have to think to myself, how do I sell this to, to uh, taxpayers? You know, how do I sell this to the folks who might pay for it? And there are nuggets in here that I think are really interesting, like the layering of government and housing, you know, uh, and social programs, I think is really interesting. I also, I agree with John that the open space all on the roof just seems to me like a recipe for inhibiting access and inhibiting protests. And I love the, the thinking that you're doing about how do we create public spaces that allow for protests and for public expressions. And I worry that these roofs will actually limit it, be much more limiting. And then when I get down to the street level with some of your, your perspectives, it looks, it looks really grim to me. Um, it, it, it just, it, it, would, it would scare me. Uh, the scale of it would scare me. So I feel like I could extract a, a piece of this and sell it, and I could sell it on its integration of activities and social integration and the idea of some, like the Soul Project, some rooftop open space, but as a whole, ugh, it would scare me. I think it would scare a lot of folks if I, if I brought it to them. Good. Good. I, it, it's meant to scare, and and I, I'm kind of happy that you say that, because yeah. I mean that that's the point. And uh, kind of coming from of a, a, a background, I'm 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 kind of mid career in this, and and for instance, I take detail into making sure that the structures work. I mean, there's a part that's really hyper realistic, but at the same time, this is the last studio project I'm going to do in my life, most probably. And so I do want to cross that line of, provo uh, in, in, of provocation into something that can contribute to a conversation. Uh, I don't think that this is sellable either. Uh, and this well, you've, su you've, you've successfully <laughs> done that. It's, it is successfully <laughs> provocative. Yeah. Um, I, just to clarify one point, I mean, I, I, when, when I, the, the Leviathan um, uh, reference I did, uh, this is not about uh, not or hiding the Hobbesian nature of government. Um, and I am much more Hobbesian than, than Rosonian. Uh, but it, it, it is about finding the form that government should have. And I do want to argue that the standalone kind of uh, paperweight uh, monument at, at, a, at a large scale is, is no longer valid. I mean, and there is room for reinvention of that. Oh, and uh, when, when I described it as a government, that's something that you can't take in with one selfie anymore. It, it's that it's something that won't even fit into a camera. I, I actually love that idea. And the master plan that you all were looking at was done prior to my getting involved. We actually did a second one that maybe is not public yet because we only presented it in, in a smaller committee. But I love the idea of not of um, City Hall not being such a standalone piece, um, such an because in fact, the history you showed very quickly, initially, this whole area was very dense. There was buildings that, right up to the street. That it's, it's not strong enough. And that what he's done is he's completely attacked any singular iconic notion of government vis-a-vis -vis the city hall, which is um, incredibly simplistic at that level. And at the same time, he's destroyed public space. He's, just, he's done two things. He's taken the, the object of, that represents City Hall and he's dispersed it horizontally and he's integrated in the city. That could have been even more so. You could push that idea further, but he literally eliminates the icon and he's totally destroyed and he's dispersed public space into little kind of pieces that doesn't even allow the possibility of your first premise, as you said it. I think, um, Alonso, that, that your pragmatism and working things out is 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 um counter to your um it seems like your greater mission 
is to prove architecture's potential in shaping behavior, public and private, in the most radical way that just asks the question that, that, that forms the uh, continued more complicated dialogue of this problem. And it has nothing to do with kind of a real solution. It has to do with something that through its provocation uh, forces us to ask questions and to approach the project a bit differently based on that provocation. Because I would have said that is the role of, uh, in certain cases, of conceptual architecture. That you would, um, Lebius needs to be here. We, we could rattle off certain people. A Peter Cook could be here. Um, a, uh, a, 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 a Wolf Pricks could be here. People that are interested in, in architecture as that the, the act of producing ideas provokes the conversation of architecture, which is um, in Deborah's, in, in Deborah, in your terms, is find some new reality that challenges the status quo. And, and in this case, stasis, because you, you made an argument for stasis, right? In, your, the, in the continued plans that are basically the same plan. And the, your, it seems like your meta narrative is to challenge that with a, a, a provocation that's gonna force us to rethink the nature of this project in terms of public space. And in terms of this case, the whole role of um, what the iconic notion of government, right? C centered or singular versus dispersed, which is the two complete opposite kind of organizational types, right? Well, I, again, the plan that everyone references for this area was not one I was involved in. And I do appreciate Alonso's criticism that it recreated really the plans of the last 50 years. And when I, when I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, no, we're not going there. But I, I, the provocation is really important. And the intellectual exploration of these issues about equity and government and the relationship to community through form and space is incredibly exciting. So, you know, I don't, I'm not, I sort of am on the same page that John is, which is, I find it really interesting. We could talk about it a long time and I find it really <laughs> frightening in its form. No, no. And as long as you said, this is your last opportunity to work at some sort of a broad conceptual level before you're put in handcuffs. Exactly. That's where you're headed, right? That's where we're headed. You're getting the handcuffs going now, right? Exactly. Now, now I go back to putting, putting myself, putting my handcuffs on again willingly so it's uh yeah th this is this is an opportunity to do the kind of hegelian antithesis no and but alonso alonso yes. um you put yourself in handcuffs with this project and i think you know doing a provocation <laughs> sorry we have an echo here for just uh, just solving this um doing a provocation um, I think one thing is very important when you're working with a provocation, you leave it at an abstract level. And this is also what Tom is saying, you know, there is like, you refer back to something like the radical architecture or something like that. These people were masters of provocation. They came up with crazy collages that we now understand a long, long time after. And they were important to make us think and to understand where we're probably going when things are going really bad, yeah? But then you leave it at that point and you don't go into detail. And I think what you've done here, yeah, because I, I think, yeah, in theory, this could all be very interesting, but um, then you are offering us all this detailed work and then it gets really scary. And that scary is not a provocation anymore. That's simply blunt scary. And there's a big difference. Yeah, so since, you're, since you were showing the example from the Reichstag, and as you know, um, I spent most of my life in Berlin, I totally agree that thing should have never happened. It makes no sense whatsoever. Now, the other thing that I find in your work that is as provocative and not working well is um, you're showing views that remind me of parts in East Berlin that were built by the communist regime and look so sad. And when I first put foot into East Berlin, it was really just so crazily sad. And there was not a single person in the street. It was all empty. And after the fall of the wall, all of a sudden there were people in the streets. 
it was getting a little bit better, but these areas still have not picked up and they will never. And I'm mm. seeing sort of in your collages, <clears throat> yeah, I'm seeing sort of similar situations, too big, too empty. And yeah, and I don't know exactly where this is headed. Yeah. Okay. So I think had you really wanted to do the provocation, it would have been better to stay on, I don't know how many variations of provocations. And that well, would have been really a provocation. Hey, two things here. I, I like frightening. I don't like sad so much. Uh, and, uh, and okay, this was, it makes me happy to, to hear that the project is, is frightening, but it makes me sad to hear that it's sad. Um, there's, now a lot of these collages are just with the street as, as it is. And, and, and I think that the kind of pedestrian nature of the collages and pedestrian in, in its two meanings, uh, I, as in ground view uh, and, and also in the very commonplace idea of, okay, this is what you see, you know, from, a, from you know, half a kilometer away. That's part of me wanting to keep this urban. I mean, this isn't an MR degree and this isn't, uh, I mean, this is an idea of how to contribute to the city. And, and so there is this kind of, I have wanted to de-glamorize a specific form because that's not what I'm trying to sell. We're trying to sell this is, is just the idea of, of, of rethinking and reinventing uh, what a, a monumental government building should be like, or what should be the form of monumentality of, of, of uh, government buildings in the future. Uh, as, as for the provocation, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going, I, I wasn't willing to do, to go full archigram because it's, uh, it, it's, it's a postgraduate program. And I, I mean, I can, I can kind of do the archigram on, on a blog, but there is a sort of temperance with experience, you know, for better or worse, I'm not saying it's, it's especially better, but there is some kind of temperance of that idea in this setting that I didn't want to leave behind. So to, for me to have kind of done the, 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 the more extreme shape or the more provocative shape at the cost of the um, part of the critiques in the in the midterm, which is like you know the okay, let's let's assume that a, a government building can work there, but we all know deep inside that you know that the lighting won't work and that the air won't work and that you know people are going to be miserable working over there. I mean, I, I don't want to uh, gain a strength in the provocation at the cost of impracticality. Uh, so I'm I'm totally. Uh, okay with a, with a critique of saying, you know, that this should have been even more provocative, but I, I wouldn't have wanted to, to get to that more provocation at the conversation Because that's defining the whole project. Because I have to say, and it'd be a conversation maybe of all of us, I would have said the project is about provoking and it's about ideas. And then that would immediately free you of the pragmatic. And I, I think it's one or the other. If it's a real project, it's, it's a completely different, you're, there's two definitions of the project here that we would, we would argue for. And I, I think it's somewhere in the middle is the problem that you need to go one way or the other. Pragmatically, it's gonna be torn apart and you're gonna, you're gonna the critiques would take you someplace. If it's about a provocation, just the opposite. It would free you to be um, much more, hmm, much stronger in terms of this idea. That, that pursues the basic um, philosophical content that you're, you're pursuing. The, um, the, res the, the various resistances and the critique that you're making, right? It, it would free you from that. And, and, mm, and I, my guess is that the provocation is so strong, it would radically challenge your program because your program doesn't really follow the potential of this idea. It's much more radical. You would really rethink the whole notion of the association of the pieces you're talking about. I would have said this is an idea that would that would absolutely challenge program, this, but not that different than than our last project in Eugene, where there was an immediate, the, the formal thing provoked various new relationships. That was its purpose, versus coming at it in traditional terms. Anyway, that's going to be a longer conversation. I have to leave too, guys. Can we put all the people up? Again? Thank you. Can we put the people up? Can we put the one that? Yeah, good. Um, I hope we have time to get together again. I'd like to see you guys and have a conversation about the year. 
because for the people that are the jury, these guys were a total fucking pain in the ass when I walked in the door, I gotta tell you. And it's been a <laughs> really, really beautiful year. And I'm super, super proud of you guys. You've done a great, great job. And you're smiling, Roger. If you'd have asked me the second week and I said, these fuckers, I, I, get me out of here, man. You know why I'm smiling? Because they're probably all thinking about what a pain in the ass you were. I'm sure. No, no, they, they, they told us that. They didn't have to think it. They told us that. <laughs> we, should, we should get together. I'd like to talk to all of you and have a, a, another a last, a last comment about the, the, the year, including this project. Wolf time time to do that. Thanks for all the jury for showing up. Deborah, I haven't sure seen thing. you in a long time. No, it's been too long, Tom, but it's thank you very much for inviting me. It's all fascinating. I don't talk about these kinds of issues every day. So. Yeah, and Roger, we no longer the Rose Cafe, dude, so we have to figure we out. We can something. still do social distancing. <laughs> I know, definitely not at the Rose. Let's find another place. I'll follow up tomorrow. Okay. Hey. Okay. See you, Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks E. Good Thank to you. see you. Thanks, Thanks. E. Uh, my Thanks. students, can you guys stay behind? Okay uh great cool 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 okay um listen i think um uh, i think you guys did a really really great job uh it took uh it took a village to uh to somehow take care of you uh daniel sasha me uh tom the security guard in cyark uh the cafeteria in cyark but at, at the end of the day, I think right now, um, the journey that you went through in this one year is not measured by the actual project it is, but in many ways, it's actually uh, the struggle that you went through to actually achieve that outcome, right? Uh, and I was, asked, I was actually gonna comment, a comment before Tom did his uh, big exit. Um, you know, like right now, this, this conversation about Alonso's project for me was, uh, it, for me, it indicates it as a successful project, not because the project itself is, is gay is judged by itself, but the fact that, uh, I know Alonzo, you know, was running a very successful office pre COVID in, uh, in Peru. And, uh, he decided to come out here to challenge himself. Right. And he didn't have to. He had an office, he had projects. He probably had projects that were better than half of the uh, uh, Sire professors, right? Uh, so that journey of uh, challenging yourself is actually a, um, a journey of courage. It's pretty hard, you know, because I don't wanna see my ugly self in the mirror sometimes, right? I wanna lie to myself that every day is, 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 is nice and I'm doing an awesome job when obviously we all know that not every day is gonna be good, right? Um, and in many ways, uh, as architects, the projects that we make, in some ways, is a crazy kind of mirror back to what we're, we're, uh, we're going through. And in, uh, in many ways, uh, the ability for anybody to kind of put themselves out there, the way that you guys somehow try to believe in us, 